It's like a pizza crunch without the butter Johnny Boy Steele, we know he is the uh, author of The Bird That Never Flew. You were infamous for your prison escapes, but what I want to try and peel back is where the first impulse to escape came from. Was it being in prison or did it happen er earlier in life? No, it actually happened earlier on in life. I, I spent quite a lot of time in my bedroom on punishment as a, a kid there, uh -huh. maybe six years of age upwards. And uh, maybe for playing truant or climbing dikes or climbing up drain pipes or you yeah, know, going to school, so and it was always the old man being uh, kind of you know, old fashioned type guy. Um, you know, he, he thought that he was everything he says had to be obeyed, and then and he, he was just one of these guys that if he didn't abide by his wishes, then he thought he was just an old user. And, and he would always say, You know, where you're going, don't you? Along the hall, go to the left and lose yourself amongst the blankets. You'll stay in that fucking room till you learn to behave and there you're told. So, and you know, even back then, staying in your bedroom at a very, very young age, you know, when you're busting the life, you know what I mean, and your pals, you can hear your pals outside playing football and, or sh chap shouting out the window, Johnny boy, you coming out? Or chapping the door and saying, Johnny boy, you coming out? And dabbing up the door and say, no, nah, that fuck pig's not getting out until he learns to behave. And so, you're lying there and you're like, I'm out of here. And the only way out, we were one up, and I uh, was born in Carntine, east end of Glasgow, tenement buildings, and so we were one up, and the only way out was through, or uh, into the toilet, because we went in for the toilet, and off in the drain pipe. And uh, then they would, they would start to hide my clothing, because I had an auntie and an uncle that stayed next close to across the landing, mm -hmm. and they would start to hide, hide my clothing, thinking that that would stop you from... Well, your parents would hide your clothing? Aye. So you aye. couldn't escape, essentially? Aye, aye. So, and then you had to wear somebody else's clothing, didn't you? So I'd wear my brother's, I'd just wear <laughs> in just to get back down the way to that drain pipe. But I just never liked the idea of being penned up. I never, could never, it just didn't agree with me. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what, don't know what was really going on in my head, but I'd rather, I'd rather have slept in the back court or in a, in a graveyard then lying in a bedroom, it was just something about bedrooms that I didn't, I just felt closed in, do you know what I mean? Ah, uh, it's it, almost I mean. like a cell in itself if you can't leave it, especially being a child, yeah. what age were you? The first time probably about six, seven. Six, seven, because yeah. Wayne's at that age, they're, uh, they're creatures of discovery. You yeah. see Wayne's, they're running about, they're running wild, man, you might be yeah. out and it's as you say, you're, you and your friends outside, you can't understand it. Yeah. You understand why I'm in here and it's that feeling of yeah. being imprisoned. Well, you know, strangely, I'd done quite a few years of that in my, my in house on punishment, you know, been under house arrest, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if this makes sense or anything like that, right enough, but through the years as I grew older and ended up in pro schools, bustles, and young offenders, and then finally into prison, spent a hell of a lot of time in solitary confinement in prison as well, probably about five, six years in solitary confinement when I was doing my. 16 year sentence in Peter Heath prison. And um, whenever I got a punishment for talking sake, which was practically every, maybe three, four times a week, eh? sorry, three, four times a week. Um, and most of that was for being abusive to the governors and the, and the, and the guards, you know. Uh, like for instance, right, still, uh, governor's report, you're downstairs, come with us, and we refuse to go and get carried down. And then the, you'd maybe in the other room, go say, right, okay, I'm going to give you. For a past sentence, you had to say, and and I'd be, I'd be, I was a kind of, I was a cheeky guy, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I thought it was cocky and being cheeky, you know what I mean? And then it was, yeah, feck you and feck you and feck, and somebody would say, you're on the port for that, I said, feck you as well. Mm -hmm. And so that would just continue every day, you know, to, you think somebody, somebody would get sick of it, you know what I mean? But to me, it became a bit of recreation, because it was better than sitting in that cell looking at the four, four walls. And so therefore, when I would leave the punishment, I used to, first thing I would do is go right back into my cell and just sit there and sing songs. And it was my, my, my music was my, my Bible. I was quite a country, 
country country music I was into, mm -hmm. and kind of gospel music. And so when we stayed in Cantine, most of my man's brothers played guitar, accordion, and mouth organ. Right. So they were always they were quite talented, and they were they were always 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 done a lot of good music coming out, and um, and also a lot of songs getting played in the record players. So I learned all the songs when I was in Cantine, and got to know more because most time I was on punishment, I could hear my dad playing his record player. So I learned I learned all the songs. And so when I left the punishment block, left the punishment um, governor's orderly room, the punishment block, your head, and go back in. You know, it's no case of oh, effect of punishment. It didn't mean nothing to me. It did mean something to you, and uh, obviously a wee bit emotional. But you couldn't show your emotions. So the minute I went back in, and that big steel door slammed behind you. You know, a couple of things you can do: you could lie down and greet, or hang yourself for the for the bars. Mm -hmm. Or you can switch off. And the only way I could switch off, and with me switching off in the way I was switching off, they, I think they thought I was crackers. I would sing. I would sit there, I'd just lie down and sing, and I would kind of mentally transport myself back to quarantine. And I would imagine it was my turn to sing at the, the fire with Uncle playing the accordion. You know, just reminiscing uh -huh. and creating a, creating a life, cre creating a life mentally. You know, the way you'd have wanted to go and say, so you know, that bastard's not been to school idea again. And I, I would change it and I'd make them say nice things. And uh -huh. So I'd just lie there and sing. And I remember, not no, no one occasion, many occasions, even my pals, the, the prisoners who were in beside me, the fuck said, Johnny, this doesn't bother you at all, don't it? These old sentences. They thought because I was in the back myself and just sitting there singing that I was happy go lucky. Ah, you're happy, you're loving life. There's, a, there's an actual fact, uh, Jordan, it was the opposite. A coping strategy. That, that's how I cope, do you know what I mean? And uh, then, of course, you're always looking for a way out, huh? Ah, that's exactly yeah. that, because, see, do you feel as if, because uh, you were always trying to escape, as you say, it was like Boston or Peru School, uh, eventually prison. Do you think part of that, the reason for that was it took you back to your childhood? That feeling of kind of, were, were you, I imagine she escaping, like, Fabian and Grounded as such, there was a thrill in it. Being able to yeah, group your pals, getting away from like, yeah, the authority. Especially, such. especially, especially in the pro schools. I mean, it was just the same. You find yourself somewhere you don't want to be, you know where you can go to it, and you know it's going to get you into trouble. And it's, you either take that chance or you don't, or you just buckle down and get on with it. But there was something about running away and escaping from these kind of places, even even at home, and and being out there at two or three o'clock in the morning, maybe yourself or with a couple of pals, when. A, the whole world was yours, it seemed, I mean, it was only you and the stars, uh -huh. you know, these places. And uh, it, was a, it was a tremendous, it was a kind of, I don't know, it was a kind of religious feeling that there was just something beautiful about it, you know what I mean? It was uh -huh. just something, you know, you're on your own, and you know, you, you obviously know that you're, you're being hunted, you know what I mean, and with the coppers and whoever else, but it was something magical about being on the run, being a rebel, and being on the run and being able to go and do, Things that you that you wish or you wanted to do, uh -huh. and uh, so I always had that. I don't know my old granny, my old ma Padden. She was blind. My mother's mother. She was she she. We grew up with her all our lives. She used to say to me, "I knew you were a blue eyed gypsy." So she, she used to call. She used to call me the blue eyed gypsy because I loved wandering. Mm -hmm. I could never ever sit in the one place. I, just, right. I, just, I don't know what it was. I've never never really been able to do that. Maybe up until about I don't know. Say. Eight nine years ago, when when I met Lorna, and I've got the kids here now. I've got a six year old, nine year old girl, <coughs> and then I say, "Well, I fancy moving, Lorna. I'm gonna be up in the Orkneys or go here." Or, no, 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 no. She says, "I think you can put all that behind you, Johnny. It's time to draw, draw up water." He says, "The wind are born here, they're at school here, primary school, and they'll grow up into the secondary school. I've met all our wee friends, all our wee pals." And it wouldn't be fair to move away now. And I'm, so she, she had a point there, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And uh, even though I think the, the border is a beautiful place, but I did find it hard to settle. I just kept, had to wonder, especially way back in the early days. Mm -hmm. And I thought it, it was easier for me to... It was easier for me to wonder than to, to stay put, do you know what I mean? And I felt a comfort in that. And I hated authority. Most kids, I suppose, did uh -huh. 
hated authority, and not just the police authority, I hated school, I hated the um, parental authority, <coughs> I hated to be penned in, and you were limited what you could do, you know, back then, and most, most times you were penned in, in your own home, because you, know, you couldn't go to certain times at night, because you didn't know, but, well, you knew about prowls, but you were always warmed off at never going near strangers, never did this and never did that. And if you're away and you wander away, and we don't know where you are, and the police are f away looking for you, and you don't realise that the, the worry and the concern that you're causing to, 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 to the people who love you the most in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when you get caught, you can put your bed again. You're like, I don't know why to be here. So you start to you start to hate the environment around about you. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. What was your relationship with your dad like? You said he was authority for get to start with, but see, as you got older, did that change, or was that always no, the case? No, no, he was... He was I, I, I tell you, <coughs> I the only way I could really sum it up, and I didn't, didn't realise this until maybe after I escaped, maybe I found out something, that, maybe something came to me before I escaped from Berlin in 1980. When we escaped from Berlin, me and Jim and my pal Archie, um, Jim was cut long story short, we were out two weeks and Jim's caught first, so he's caught on a Saturday, and uh, if he hears it, it's all the news. So we went down to the phone box at Berlini, oh sorry, we went down to the phone box and phoned Berlini. And uh, and it was days at the old phone box and the old money thing, that. Uh -huh. Phoned up, he put us through to Berlini prison, please. And the operator put us through and I uh, heard the voice. Hello, officer so-and-so, uh, how can I help you? I went, listen, it's Johnny Boy Steele here. I said, no, my brother Jim's been caught. I said, no, might you pass his message on to the governor? Andy Gallica, slash the Gallica was a government at the time. I said, Vince, you happen to my brother. Um, I'm going to come down to the gatehouse and just do his. I don't care who he's or where he's there. We'll get your way in, go to school, get your wives, go to the bingo, it doesn't matter. He passed that mission, because they were, they, they, were, they were more than capable of doing uh, my don't brother back terrible, days. terrible harm, you know what I mean? So, and you, know, uh, and you could only stay on the phone for so long before they could trace it. Nobody didn't matter then, because we were in our phone box. So, and the Sunday I'm caught, me, me and my pal are just caught on the Sunday. And uh, so I know I'm going back, I know I'm going back to face the music for threatening, I'm going back to face the music for escaping anyway. And I'm going back to face the music for the threatening phone call that I told the, the guard to pass on to um, the governor. So we were caught on the Monday and uh, the governor came out to see us on the, we back to Berlini. Um, and the governor comes out to see us and he's like, no, I thought you would just been out of the country, yeah, still. I thought your old man would have had you out of the country eh, by now. Well, I don't know, on the Monday morning, that very Monday morning, that my dad had went down to Blinney Prison and held in a letter to whoever it was at the gatehouse. He said, pass that to the governor. And uh, so the governor's telling me about it on this Monday morning, then he's round. I thought your old man would have had you out of the country. I said, well, maybe the next time. He said, well, I hope I'm going to be here next time. And anyway, Andy was demented because there was a big police inquiry into bribes that was passed on when during our escape from for, for Berlin. And so there was a hell of a hell of a loo going on there regarding that matter. And we were now waiting on, um, we were granted immunity for Berlin by the Secretary of State of Scotland because the CID thought they were going to get the information after me, Jim and Archie regarding the guards who took the bribes. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, they, they wanted to protect us. So they said, we can get you transferred out uh, to any prison you so wish. But don't worry, because we'll, we'll go to your own protection. Okay. And he said, well, we're probably not going to get done anyway. He says, nah. He said, anybody put it on you, he says, we'll, we'll take whoever necessary to be going to the jail, jail of Langmies. And they've all been told. So that was online for us getting um, granted immunity in the next couple of days. So Andy Gallagher says to me, he says, uh, oh, I got your phone call. I went, oh, aye. He says, what is it with you, Steele? He says, I even got a letter for your dad handed to me in this morning. He said, I knew your dad through the 30 years. He says, um, he said, and the, the letter he sent me, well, I don't know about this letter until he tells me, and I don't even know the contents of the letter. So he says to me, um, he said, the only thing I can think of regarding your father, he says, he's done too long in the jail far too long in the jail. So anyway, that left me thinking of the contents, wait, I'm, I knew it had to be fresh, you know what I mean? 
And he was quite capable, you know what I mean? He was an old, an old gangster, wasn't he? He was an old safe blower, bank robber, always got done with guns and explosives. So he, he was well, he was well got with, with the criminal fraternity, yeah. mm. and he was quite a serious contender. So that was his way of letting the governor know it ain't happened to my boys. Hey, you, you, you're caught in your back, we're fucking doing, they'll do you, they'll do this and do the next thing. Did you, do you know what he actually wrote in the letter? Or was uh, that just no, the no, 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 no. I found that this was on the Monday morning after we, after we came back from court for a skating. And the month we got done, Jim got done the, sun, the Saturday, we are done, me and Archie had done the Sunday. And we went to court on the Monday morning. So we've landed back in Barney Prison. So it was Tuesday, it was a Tuesday Andy Gallagher came in, Tuesday morning. So I only found out about the contents of the letter when my dad came up with visitors. Right, so it was your dad told you? Aye, he says, I held that, held him in a letter there, he says, he says I wrote it in Technicolor. He, he, he would send you a letter, he always sent you a beautiful handwriting he was there. Uh -huh. But it was a cheeky letter, then some of the words would be highlighted in Technicolor, do you know what I mean? Right. So there was no mistaking what you were getting your character. Okay. So he said, I. He said, uh, I said, what about the policy? We're not your door. He went, fuck the policy, you'll get it or not. So he threatened to blow his sister up. He threatened to blow the governor's sister up. Uh, the event happened to, to me and Jim. Well, you know, and what, and what, and what, that had been the right thing to do. And, and, and our environment, uh -huh. you know, because if you can't, if you've not got anybody on the outside to back you up and look out at, look at for your best interest, you, you can you can lose a lot of weight, you know what I mean? Mm. You can lose a lot of weight, man, mentally, you know what I mean? Do you think but, it had the desired effect, the letter? Well, he knew it was, it was, it was a serious... It was, uh, it, so he it, knew it, it was like there was, it, it was it, serious it, weight behind it? He'd been done with, he'd been done with explosives and that before, he, he, he was really... This was more than capable? I, I could tell, I don't really want to say too much, I could tell you a couple of incidents that, um, that he was involved in, and a lot of people know it, you know what I mean? But no. No, people are in the day, no, it make any difference because he's dead now, you know what uh -huh. I mean? But I know there was a case where, where Jimmy Boyle was involved and when Jimmy got done for one of the murder, what, a murder, he was done for a couple of murders, but one murder in particular. Jimmy Boyle, who wrote the book Sense of Freedom, uh -huh. um, when Jimmy Boyle was charged with the murder, he was lying in the unsfide and there were a couple of things needed sorted out. And I, I know my dad, Andy Steele, um, went down to where the where the witness stayed and put a put a jelly night bomb on his window ledge and uh, so I know that he was they, they all knew he was quite capable right, of doing a lot okay. of serious things, you know what I mean? So as much as a it's not a case I didn't like him, uh, Jordan. I just fucking never got to know him. Mm -hmm. Is that between him being in jail and you being in jail? That was between I would say it was meant to do with his attitude. Right. I would say it was meant to do with my dad's attitude than anything else, eh? Because it would always be like, right, listen, in for school, uniform off, all shoes on, all clothes on, not let me catch you and jump puddles with the new shoes or climbing dikes with the new shoes or that. And so, what do you end up then? You end up fucking climbing a dike or jumping the new shoes and it would be chap at the window. Right, fuck pig up the stairs. You're just not going to listen to anybody, are you? You fucking think I'm talking to myself. So when he was using that attitude on me, I just fucking switched off. Mm -hmm. It was just like getting the punishment in Peter Heed prison. I just fucking switched off. Uh -huh. And we, 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 we switching off. And plus I had a squint back then. I developed a squinty eye. Yeah. Okay. And I know, I only know this now because I know a few people who's got a squinty eye. And you can look like a cheeky bastard, you know what I mean? If you, you, you're talking to somebody, you think you fucking like to me that for? <laughs> and uh, so he would be like, you listening to what I'm saying to you? And he'd be pointing at me, finger right in the face. You fucking listen to me. And he'd be like, don't you ever fucking look, 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 to, look, at, look at me like that again. Eh? And you don't know, you don't know who looking, you're looking, the eyes going in and it just makes you look like an, uh, an attitude. I don't know if you've got an attitude. Or do you mean, Is that you're not paying attention? I don't know, but it's no pain attention. Just uh, you look cheeky, you know what I mean? Right, you just okay. squint your eye. So I never, I can never break that barrier down between him and I when it came to uh, family values and his attitude. It just wasn't nice, you know what I mean? The way he spoke to me, and or Joe at times, in most times, was the way we spoke to the turnkeys. We were attitude, maybe not Peter Heed. Mm -hmm. And the punishment block. You know what I mean? We had 
that was the kind of attitude I would have used on a on a on a turnkey. Uh -huh. I wouldn't have spoke to one of my own like that. You know what I mean? Aye. My mind siblings, my kids. Authority you know I mean? figures. So, but it was just just as that, and it, and you know, I dare say I dare say we must have messed the heat up, because eh? I know when I when I done my my big settings and I used to talk to a couple of pals, we fancy having a ride and we're going to escape or whatever. Oh, fucking hell, Johnny Beast, the fuck I can go away, mate. I can't fuck, I haven't got kids, you know what I mean? Well, I never had any kids. So, I can understand, as I got older myself, the worry your kids give you, and you're trying to keep them on the straight and narrow. And he would say things like, you know, I don't want you fucking go down this road with me, I don't want you following my footsteps. This isn't the life of you, and you'll fucking let, you'll learn when it's too fucking late, you do listen to me. And it was that attitude. And uh, I learned to, not to listen to him, but see one of his per one of his pals or one of his uncles said the exact same thing to me. Without that attitude, I'd have probably listened to every word mm -hmm. that was being said yeah. and and, res and and appreciate. But because it was him, it was then like, these barriers were up everywhere. Ah, you know the I mean? rebellious nature was setting in. So whenever whenever he whenever he would say something, to me, right, I give you an example. I come in from school. I used to creep up 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 to London. I would always come in late and I'd creep up to the landing, up to the letterbox and I would just stand in the, stand in the landing. And uh, I knew, I would know if they knew that I hadn't been to school. And Because you would hear the occasional, wait that fuck pig comes in, know me at school all week, fucking school, boarding up fucking every day. So I'd be like, ah, fuck him off man. So I'd bolt, I'd be, I'd be going stout all night, you know what I mean? So. I, I, I didn't. I didn't enjoy school. I hated school. Couldn't concentrate. I was. I had none concentration whatsoever. I remember the teacher. He used to, he used to have the big pointers back in the day. Poking you. You listen to what he said to you. And the truth of the matter was, I probably wasn't listening. I didn't know how to listen. I just didn't want to be there. I was probably running across fields or something. I was sitting in that in that chair. Right. And so it comes in one, one day, caught on a wells. He's like, is that him there, Margaret? And my man says, aye, what do you mean in school, Johnny? He's fucking gone nuts in there, the fucking school board me up. I'm like, nah, I've been I've been to school, ma. Oh, please fucking don't go in there and tell me you have you've been at school you've not been at school. I tell me you have been at school, you've not been at school. So anyway, you know you're fucking you know you're trapped. Mm -hmm. And he's like, how do you how do you go to school a day? I'm like, alright, alright, all right. Well, all right. He says, uh, how'd you go to school yesterday? I went, mean, okay, what did you learn this day and that day? I mean, listen to you, you fucking idiot, you. Do you know who's been up here today? And I fucking know who's been up. I'm like, oh, here we fucking go. So you pick a spot and home in on it on the wall. So you didn't, you couldn't, you didn't want to have an eye contact with uh -huh. me. The fucking school board been up. And the first thing I think was, I've been at school, it's no me, it must be somebody else I think about, everybody's telling lies. And he would say to me, I fucking tell, I fucking hate a liar, the fucking biggest liar in the country, I fucking went to court and played no guilty, I've never got charged with you for life. <laughs> so he's like, fucking, I'm giving you one chance, Johnny, I'm taking you to school tomorrow, you've not been to school all fucking week, the school board's been here, and don't sit and call everybody fucking liars. Tell me. If you don't want to tell me, take your mum into the kitchen and tell mother that you've no been that you've no been to school and I won't put a on you. No, I promise you, I won't. So my mother, Johnny, please tell <laughs> fucking oh, I don't know what's going on in my head, but it was a fear, you know what I mean? Aye. And uh, probably if I could have found a way to get into a self and just comb her back in there, I fucking took it, <laughs> you know, by both both hands. My mum's like, just tell him, Johnny, son, please, we know you've no been. I said, I have been to school. I fucking denied it, you know. And they would say, one thing, I, one thing I hate is a fucking liar. And then, the, and then the next breath he would say, listen, if you ever get into trouble with the coppers, you don't bring it with this fucking door because you don't stay here. And another thing, if you do end up in trouble with the coppers, you plead guilty to fucking nothing. Do you hear me? You, you listen, you're like a few years fucking thick head. You admit to fuck all. And so there was, he would say to me, one thing I hate is a fucking liar. One thing is a liar, tell me about school, I denied the fucking right to vote to the school room. That's when I admitted it. Uh -huh. I, mean, I, always, I knew I was going to get to do it in, in the school playground or in the school corridor. Uh -huh. It was good for getting it. Huh? But his attitude, his attitude towards me and Jim and Joe was all wrong. 
and he did a lot of a good bit of time. In fact, when when we knew he was in the jail, my my mum would come and say, or somebody would say, "Fuck, hey, you're not get fucking free here today or whatever." Fucking, we were delighted, man. Fucking really, me, eh? Fucking me and Joe we were fucking dancing and jigging off, fucking jumping on the bed for the world of new fucking somersaults and I we were fucking highly delighted because uh -huh. that was the only time we ever really got freedom in the, in the true sense of the word. Uh -huh. To go enjoy yourself and foot, having to worry about fucking him picking out Wendy's to 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 fucking catch you climbing dikes when you listen he's gonna be bed, bed, bed and fucking you know, too long in bed. Uh -huh. And anyway, I fucking I played through it that much. I ended up getting sent to a sent to what they called a special school back then. Uh -huh. And uh, what what they done was we back then this the the bus they took you in was a grey kind of bus. Grey a, a grey colour, jail grey. Right. Or gunmetal grey, but like a jail grey, a grey van it was called, and it looked like a, a Reliance van. They fit the, they fit the cells, you know what I mean? And uh, there was quite a lot of people there, and they used to go through the housing schemes in the east end of Glasgow and pick people up. But the van always got made a mockery with ordinary kids and people in the, in, in, in the main streets and the housing schemes that when they went to pick uh. people up. So there was people, people there with, with calipers and people there in wheelchairs and people there with twisted limbs and you know my my point my purpose for being there was because I was backward because when we playing through it that often you know everybody starts off in the same level in the same class mm -hmm. and they all move up through the ranks together and if there was a dropout such as myself then they couldn't cater for me or the likes of me. We are a class that was way ahead of me, uh -huh. so they, they would send you to a special school for backward kids and people with with these um, these problems with a with a body, and uh, oh, and he fucking went nuts, didn't he? When he heard fucking embarrassing when he's shouting, fucking I just smothered that bastard, I just smothered this cunt at birth. Wait, did fucking, he say that to you? Oh, I said that to me a few. I fucking smothered you at birth, you fuck pig. You. That was his favourite word. Anybody in there like with a fuck pig, yeah. Uh -huh. So anyway, and uh, so you know you're you're then face, facing mere hardship. You know what I mean? You, you know you're going to a school that is a mockery of the fucking of the society. You know what uh -huh. I mean? Aye. For all walks of life, huh? And uh, so I went, you know, only one thing to do was I'm not going to that school either. I'm mm -hmm. not going to any school, which means you're going to end up in a poor school. Aye. And then when you land in a poor school, I'm not fucking staying here either, which means you're then a runner. And then you get caught and brought back, and then you're doing this and doing that, and then you get sent to another approved school because you're really in that approved school, and you know, I'm just staying here or I'm off, and so that pattern just kind of a. Uh, it's hardwired <coughs> into your brain, that, that escapism. Just just continue, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, but in the same token, when I was in the approved school, um, St. Joseph, 1969 to 1970, I think, or 70. There was a crazy monk in there. In fact, I ran away. Ran away probably about, I don't know, eight times or something. And um, and every time you ran away from these places, Jordan, you, you're, you're talking about you're 12, 13 years of age. So you're out in the sticks. You're in a place called Trenent. There's no motorways back in the day. There's no, there, you've got the train, you've got the buses, but there's no, no motorways back in the day. And so it was a long way to get back to, to Glasgow. And the only way you could do it would be either a thermal lift, which was a no no, mm -hmm. or you could jump on a train, which would be a go, or you could jump on a bus, but you needed the money to do that. So we used to go out and break into shops or and the likes when we ran away for the poor school so we could get money and make our make our own our own way our own way home. Uh. Mm -hmm. So this uh, this particular time I was uh, in, this, in a housing scheme and I'm on the run for St Joseph's. So there were a couple of older boys, uh, one was my co-accused and for some years further down the lane, a guy called John Henry. John Henry, he was, he was only, John was probably only 16, but he, he had the beard and everything, you know, they were all kind of, they were all kind of, uh, growthed up. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Where, but I never shaved. I was about twenty-five or something, twenty-six, <laughs> thirty. Baby faces all the way. So they, they, well, they were all, they were a different, different, a different breed. 
you know, same same kind of a generation, but they were all uh, sideburns and moustaches, and we were just the pound or not more, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So John Henry has chased me and he's grabbed me and he's fucking dragged me up up to the house, and I'm like, oh, please don't. And we stayed at uh, the number of our close in the Gatlock Road in Gathamlock, and East End of Glasgow was 999. It was quite a notorious close, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, he's dragging me up the close, and I'm kicking and I'm screaming. So my dad's come out, and he's, he's fucking much to my surprise. He, he went nuts to at John Henry. I said, what the fuck you? And the puzzles are Polish box, the old police boxes, the old blue police boxes, the old Doctor Who, th Doctor Who ones. Right. There's one of them right so beside. It's a direct line to the Polish? Aye. Right, okay. There's one it's like a phone box, but it's direct to the police. Aye, right, okay. aye. But the police you also use it. You know, it's a wee right. kind of sub police station there. Right, okay. So there's one of them outside the house, so all Andy's went nuts. And I don't know if you maybe had a couple of uh, guns in the house, because they'd already been done before, with uh, having guns in the house there. So he came out and he said to John Henry, what the fuck are you causing this fucking commotion in this landing for? He might bring a cop outside the door. He said, I've got Johnny where he said, I don't give a fuck who you've got. He's causing a scene outside my fucking front door. He's fucking leave him alone. And he said, right, you come in. And uh, I thought, here we go. He's going to be fucking dragged back to the poor school or whatever. So he says to me, look, Johnny. He says, the one that's worried most about this is your mother. He said, I'm not saying I'm not worried about it. He said, but your mother's more worried about it than else for you out there on the run. Nobody knows where you are. <coughs> Police can't find you. You know, next any way I contact you. So he says, what's happening at Proof School anyway? I said, well, I don't like it. I said, the, the monks are fucking, I said, they're crackers. He said, oh, what's going on? And I told him about the, one of the monks who's, he's, he's in there 12 years right now, Brother brother Benedict. Real name is Brother Murphy. Brother Benedict, so he's the other Sal um, order name. <coughs> And Bootsy was his, his nickname. Okay. Big brother Bootsy. Because he wore these boots that looked as if they were made in John Brown's shipyard, you know, for for sure, rather than anything else. Uh -huh. So, I told my dad about it. I said, this, this guy's electrocuting us, me and my pals. He was electrocuting us? Aye. How the fuck was he doing that? He's he some wee gadget he had made up. When he, like a cattle prod or something? Aye, something. I don't know if it was a cattle prod, but. <coughs> It was a wee box he had there. Right. So one day, the, there's a tip, we, we had gone to chapel, and I'm sure it was a Sunday, and we were all going to lie in the corridor, and this, this door was open. And my pal said, you see that there, Johnny? I said, I clocked it. It was a tobacco tin with a cigarette lighter on it. I said, I'm going to get that on the way back. So, and he was setting a trap, this, this brother. So on the way back, I stopped the kind of time, I and jumped into it to grab a tobacco thing off his table and fucking just hit the grin. I didn't know what was happening there, in convulsions, yeah. And this crackpot had electrocuted me, he, he'd rigged it up. But he'd also done it with a couple of other guys, and that's why he's in there in a 12-year sentence. He rigged sentence. up the tobacco tin, so when you touch it, Aye, the, the shock goes through He'd rigged the tobacco tin, I'd imagine if you're under, underneath the table, it was just sitting up there. Uh, and he was hiding, he was hiding nearby, he, he'd set a trap, you know what I mean? So I told my dad about it. And I also told him about brother, the other brother, brother Mark. I said, he, he helped me with a, it was either a paperweight or an ashway, the head brother. And uh, and he, his attitude was, and he probably had the right attitude, but brother Mark would say at the meetings, I'm sick of certain guys in this, this school running away and breaking into places nearby or around or thereabouts. And getting this place a bad name, the fucking place is full of pickpockets, cutthroats and God knows what other kind of crimes. Mm -hmm. He says, so, when he's looking at me, he's saying this, so I'm going to say this to you. The next time anybody wants to run away from here, come to my office and I'll give you, I'll give you the fare. And uh, that way you'll no need to break into any places. You should tell me how much you need for the train fare. He says, well, it'll be a matter of time before he's a apprehended and brought back again. So we are sitting, we are sitting this day, and my pal's like that. Uh, do you think he's been, been serious, Johnny? I went, fuck knows. And he uh, says, well, we might have, do you have your fancy going up and ask them? And he's like, I don't know why, why don't you? So about three or four of them up to his office, and there I chopped the door. 
I heard was come in. So I walked in, Jordan, but the crew behind me is not come in. Right. So he said, well, says, we close that door behind you. So he obviously knew that well, that's probably why we're up there, and you could hear them laughing. So he says to me, well, how can I help you? And uh, I said, remember you were talking about the, the train fair and uh, at the big meeting, that if anybody wanted to run away, then they would get the, they could come and ask you for the, for the money. So like, who's all running away then? I says, me, so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. He said, well, where the bloody hell are they? Is that them outside the door laughing and giggling? And it was them outside the door. Eh? This crack pot's not so much you need. And I don't even know the prices or anything. Eh? I want an exact figure, he says. And uh, so I knew I wasn't getting the money by this time. But anyway, he started getting a bit angry. And he threw, he f I don't know if it was a cigarette, um, a kind of crystal ashtray, or one of these paperweights. Eh? But he threw it anyway and it hit me. So I turned and bolted and I'm off right out the door on my way down the stairs and right, out of, right, out of, right over the wall and into the fields and off -ski. So I tell my dad about it. This particular time I talked about when the big John Henry chased me to take me back home. Uh -huh. And he says, right, look Johnny. He says, uh, I'll tell you what I can do with you. He says, I'm not going to take you back. I'm not going to put a horn in you. He says, but I'll tell you what I can do with you. I can take you back. He says, and I can guarantee you that nobody will put a hand on you when I'm done with them. So, and my ma was saying, I'll just go back, son, and my wee boy, ma, wee granny, granny Padden, she was saying, oh, Johnny, please go back. So I felt obligated, because I knew they were kind of wounded because of the, the, the situation that I was in, you know what I mean? And they were more concerned, and plus they couldn't hide it anyway, they showed it, you know? Uh -huh. So I said, look, he said, I'll take you back, and I guarantee you, so on the day in question, I think I stayed there for a couple of nights, or I stayed in Manti's house for a couple of nights so that the coppers came to the door, they, they wouldn't get me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next day, or a couple of days later, there was a guy from Edinburgh, um, a pal of my dad's, a wee guy whose name was Professor. And there was another guy, a big guy called George Roman, a big, 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 big fella. And uh, so we thought about I know I'm going back to the Bruce school then, but even on the way out there, I still fucking, I still wanted to just stay stop the car and run away, you know what I mean? But uh -huh. it was one of these situations, but I was saying, you know what, if I told my mother not to go back, and if anything happens, and when I go back, I can always run away again anyway. But I was reluctant, you know, in my heart, and so, you know, I didn't want to go back. I was sort of like a kind of coerced into it, where Andy's good attitude for the fucking first time in a long time. Mm -hmm. I'll guarantee you, nobody will, nobody will harm you. So we just went to the poor school, um, Trent, St Joseph's boy, the poor school, and um, the, the De La Salle monks, brothers, they, 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 they were in an exercise yard, and so it was about 100, maybe 150, 120 boys in the, an exercise yard, and uh, there was probably about 60 footballs, and everybody was kicking balls, and that was, that was how your, your recreation period took mm. place. But when I drove in it, well, when we drove in, my dad and he used to, plus my mother was there. They'd uh, just drove uh, right into the, the yard, stopped short of the brothers and, and the kids all playing football. And uh, we got the car, and my dad said, Right, where's, where's this where's this fuck pig's office? I said, He's up there. So we were walking towards the door, and so one, of the, one of the teachers came out and says, Can I help you? So I was here to see brother Mark. And uh, he said, Just keep walking, Johnny. He said, I'm right behind you. And uh, we was up to up to brother, Mark, brother Mark's office. It says on his door, not before he enter. And I went, I said, up the fucking door. So he uh, goes in there, and my man's panicking. She does you want any any trouble? We commit it. Do you know what I mean? She's a wee warrior, a wee mother. You know what I mean? Like Miss Marie Ma's back in the day. Uh -huh. And uh, she like Andy, don't start. So we goes in, and he's <coughs> sitting behind the desk. He's quite a handsome big cunt, brother Mark. He was a, he was a neck. He was a professional rugby player right. at some point in his life, eh? and really dark, Italian looking, dark skin, silvery hair, but powerful, powerful guy, you know. So we got in, and my dad, I heard my dad saying, is, You're the fuck pig that likes hitting me boys with ashtrays. And anyway, it was <coughs> both <coughs> words back and forward. And anyway, after about half an hour, it was kind of calmed down. 
and he says to says to my dad, he's, he's causing nothing but trouble here. He said, I can guarantee you, if he shows me good behaviour for six months, I guarantee you he'll be home. And then the next thing he hears, are you fucking listening to what this man saying to you? And I'm like, Jesus Christ, here we go again. <laughs> and I don't want to listen to what you're saying, because I, I can't wait six months to get a fucking man out there and then. I don't want to wait six days. And uh, so that was the agreement. Johnny, you just behave yourself and we'll get you and you behave yourself. But by that time, my life was too far gone. I was already in, in the woodwork and the, the subculture and made friends with all the good people, but some would say all the rank people, uh -huh. and became comfortable in a life that was meant to be a deterrent, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Unfortunately, that's, that was, that is the way, that's what, that's what the outcome is, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So, the case of, right, okay, wait, listen, Johnny, I'm going to go away now, this is my dad, where do I go now? He says, that, he says to his pal, the guy, Professor, he says, write down your phone number and get you my, get my boy. And uh, so is that, if we leave here and then have you again, Johnny, because he threatened to fucking, he threatened the brothers, uh, I don't want my boy to get messed up, my son get messed about, and I will come fucking back and I'll make no mistake about it. So he was a serious contender and they came across as one and yeah. they, obviously, they obviously knew he was anyway. <coughs> so, the professor gives me his, this wee guy, the professor gives me his phone number and uh, he says, if we ever need to, he says, you get get your phone box and I'll come and get me a to get you picked up. My man said, no, Johnny, you don't, you don't need that, son, you don't really need that. You, you've got a chance here, this man's saying he could have you in six months' time. And the brother's like, yeah, I think, Johnny says, you shouldn't accept that. Six months, six months of good behaviour is all I'm asking at you. Well, God's sake, Jesus Christ, when I get six months of good behaviour out of me, yeah, because it wasn't in me, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I don't mean that in a derogatory sense or a blaspheming sense, you uh -huh. know? So, um, when he when he's leaving, they're all leaving, I'll wave, wave goodbye to him. And it was a couple of months later, a chap at the window, we were out in the exercise yard. And we, 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 we were, we, we'd been an escapee, we had to wear these corduroy um, knickerbocker shorts. These cord shoes that come out down to, come down to your knees. Right. And the other guys in the pro school would all, could all wear long, long-legged trousers. Eh? But because we were escapees, we had to, had to wear these, these knickerbocker right. shorts. I think it was just, you would feel embarrassed. It would be easy to spot. Ah, you, he's done it a bit So anyway, I guess a chap in the window and the brother Mark's up there and he's like me, not here. And uh, oh, Andy had been done. He'd been done for, um, he'd been done with explosives. For your dad? Aye, he'd been done with explosives. Him and him and the big guy George Drummond. Uh -huh. They two had been done with explosives. They get five years each. So the brother Mark was there to let me. Know. And I still hadn't wasn't he behaving myself. You know, I was still losing marks here and there. Because you had to twelve points to have a home leave. Right. He could lose two points for something silly. Uh -huh. On no. Then your bed properly, whatever. Right, okay. So it's quite easy to lose marks that then stoked you for getting a home leave. And uh, that's when I found out my dad, my dad got five years for, for exposures, and uh, George Roman got five years. So I didn't want to be hanging about then because I, I was thinking there was going to be a kickback or a comeback here. Yeah, I know, he's, the, he's at the picture. He's at the picture there. Eh? So, but even though he was a cruel bastard to me, me and Joey, I don't mean he was utterly cruel, he was just wasn't nice, you know what I mean? Aye. Even though uh, he, he had that attitude between me and Joe, now I can maybe maybe think as to why he had that, maybe we didn't, couldn't live up to his expectations, whatever he was expecting us. I don't know if he was expecting us to be um, a gangster or a fucking farmer, uh -huh. you know what I mean, or a, or a milk boy or whatever. I just didn't know where you stood. I just didn't know where we stood with him. Uh, it's probably a kind of reflection of his upbringing as well, because yeah. that's what it is, it's just, it's just, it's just uh, passing on. Uh, chaotic upbringings, but see, <clears throat> if I can just take you a bit forward, where your story pretty much began in the prison was when you were sentenced to 12 years, Yeah. but when we were speaking about it before, you expected around about four, the 12 was quite harsh, Yeah. can you tell me about the circumstances that occurred that led to this, that led to the getting the 12 years? Yeah, well, 
I would what probably about 20, 19, 20, 21. We were, um, we were all, we were all thieves there. Uh. We used to gallivant all the country, uh, all over, Airdrie, Coke Bridge, Hamilton, all the, all the quiet places, uh -huh. which were quiet back then anyway. Uh. And uh, then robbery started taking place, but some ice cream guys, but some ice cream van owners would ask us to go and rob somebody else's ice cream van or cave all the windies in and, and you, you, you would get away with it. Uh -huh. And uh, we started getting involved in, in robbing debt men and debt collectors um, all over the place between, all over the place back when East End of Glasgow. And um, it became quite an easy, an easy urban jump shop counters. To, to, to get the money out of the tills, you know, uh -huh. it was kind of a desperado. But it was, it was more stupidity rather than desperado because I was, I was never desperate for money and I was never a, I was never on drugs, never took drugs in my life and I was never, never had a, a drink problem. So it was stupidity more than desperado. It was just the way, the way it went. People just started doing robbies and jump counters for easy money. Uh -huh. And uh, so I got caught up with a wee crew that I'd known for back in the days of the pro school. And we used to go thieving way back then, but as we kind of grew out of the pro school and into young friends bursts and that, we kind of went our own ways. Uh -huh. Then we met up again with, with a different mindset. And we were talking about robbies, we'll do this and we'll do that, and we'll rob this post office and rob that. And uh, so we get put onto a turn, um, who a family who owned ice cream vans um in east end of Glasgow and were told that the money was kept somewhere in the house, which turned out to be a load of crap anyway. So three or four even up my mass on and got into the house and they uh, ransacked it as such looking for this money and whatever else we meant to be but it turns out there was no money there at all. It turns out that the money had uh, had been taken to the bank the day prior to it, so we began to think that that we'd been set up uh -huh. with just somebody who was just talking all the crap or just try to gain favour because we were, we were kind of in boys at the time, know what I mean, we uh -huh. going looking for trouble and earning money. So then we got done for doing a debt man who was um, collecting for whatever may well be, I don't know if it was pools, pools money or whatever else people got themselves in debt for back then. But that was always that was always a lot of money that the debt man carried about with me. And they we we done this debt man in a house in Mackenzie. Sorry, a close in Mackenzie. And we robbed them with a I don't know, four or five hundred pounds back then. And they we ended up in prison. We ended up on on my toes. You know, the cops were looking for us. And of course, our Andy was going nuts again. Fucking warned you about this, Johnny. You're going to end up doing fucking years for nothing. Not a fucking thing. I'll try to fucking warn you about this all these years ago. He said, just fucking in one ear the other. And uh, he was probably right, you know what I mean? So, when they came to the court, came to the trial coming up, we all got remanded. It was a case of, you know, according to the older team, uh, the guys who who would know a lot about the law, you know, the prisoners in, in the jail, they would begin there, they would begin you their take on it. Ah, you only get a four. Uh, jail lawyers? Five. Aye. You only get this and you only get that. And uh, so on the on the day of the trial, and it's all learning come to me, do you know what I mean? Now this new way of life and this fucking start to talk about high court cases, whereas prior to that was just sheriff, sheriff cases. Uh -huh. what I mean? And uh, I wouldn't seem to be just by a learning cop. So when somebody who probably didn't know anything was telling you something you'd never heard before, it sounded like music to your ears. No. Ah, this is very feasible. For this reason, that they don't be able to prove this. And I don't know what the fucking court we're talking about. And they probably didn't have a clue either. Yeah. So they, they then become the, 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 the lawyers. But they're talking as if they're in, 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 in the dock, uh -huh. defending, you know what I mean? And then that kind of shit was music to your ears. But... Oh, Wendy was bang on when he says, I never wanted this kind of life for you, Johnny, so I tried my fucking best. I tried to drum out you uh, fucking all day, fucking years in bed. He said, I thought it might have helped you. But 
truth of the matter is, it, it did help me, but only after I get the 12 year sentence that I can mm. tell you about. So, go to court, and I'm doing the, we're on the cell in High Court in Glasgow, we're doing stairs. There's a North Court and there's a South Court. So you've got two High Court buildings in the one building, plus the Moxie just in the corner for it, in case mm. you drop down deep in the fucking. That was in case you drop down you didn't get in the fucking in the dock when you get your sentence. <laughs> I need to. So, there's a crew down there, and they'll be canting, and you're on, you're on for the old, um, David, David Galloway, the pally was called Cokey, and uh, and four or five other guys. So we're on the one cage down the stairs, and there uh, were two different courts. So during the tea break, and we're all talking, and uh, they're in for firing shotguns, Jordan. They're in for shooting, shooting a gang, a gang land shootings. They were in for the firing guns in public and all that, you know, shotguns mm -hmm. and the likes. So the consensual opinion was that, oof, they're going to get heavy sentences. You'll be alright, me man. You'll uh -huh. be fine, Johnny. You fucking sent you these guys get. And uh, it turns out that um, they get they get fives and fours. I think there's maybe three or four of them up for it. But they never get any more than a five year sentence for each other part in the uh, firing the guns there. And I go to court and uh, I get to the 12 year, and my co accused got a five year and the other two. The other court accused get five years, so I get the biggest sentence out of the lot. Why did you get the biggest sentence? Well, the old judge says to me, I've no doubt in my mind still that you were a ringleader, which wasn't, a, which wasn't a, was far from the truth. Do you, well, know you give him that indication? Would you think it was your dad? No, I, don't, don't, I don't think anybody gave him The only, the only people that could have came for would be the CID. Yeah, maybe it's probably it's like came came for like, listen, he's masterminded this. So it's going all I came for. I'm not saying he masterminded it, this is just cunt's son, we've been after him for years. Aye, so. So when I got to 12 years, I was like, fucking hell man, I don't know. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. I just wasn't thinking right, do you know what I mean? I wasn't thinking sensibly. Aye, stunned. Because I, I was stunned, I know, I was fucking, I didn't know what to say or what to do. And that probably made me feel even worse because they got half of what I got. Aye. And uh, then when I met my, my when I met with some of my dad's pals in the jail, and especially doing the the, the cages down on, underneath the high court, there was a guy there, Teddy Shoes, and he was a good pal of my dad's, and he was like me, fucking hell, man, that's fucking shocking, because I was a big big sentence back then, you know, that's fucking that's dirty bastards. Do you know why they've done that, Johnny? Because they couldn't get your dad. So that made me even feel worse. So I, uh, I began to think that I had a terrible liberty. No, no saying to myself, you fucking, you got in jail because you're in stupidity. Aye. Uh, so all these kind of people feeling, you know, I wish the fuck I could do the time for you, son. Honestly, God, dirty bastards. And look, my dad already back in the day, they were done with explosives and guns and they, they were near neither. They, they get fives and sixes, but no, but it came to me 12 years. So that kind of blittered me. That made me feel the fuck. And, you get a chance to, to, to get yourself together and you say, how am I going to get through this? And part of you saying, oh, 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 I'm going to be looking hard act to follow Johnny. And other part of you saying, get into education and do this and do that, you know, all the positive things are. But the negative things outweighed the positive things that was going in my head. There was like fucking three or four guys in there, you know what I mean? And um, you can't escape from what's going on inside your head, you know what no, I mean? I definitely know, especially in a cell. You can break out a, you can break out a cell, and most can break out your cells in prisons, but trying to escape from what's going on inside your head is an entirely different matter, you know what I mean? Different different consequences are. And so, it was try to, try to figure a way out, you know, good or bad. And then the mere fact of that, fuck, I, f I fucking blew my life away, man. No realising, no thinking. Rationally about it, because that 12 years was like a, life, a life sentence to me. Because I began to think, well, my mother and my pardon's not going to be here in this, when I get out of here. And I don't want to fucking be here anyway. I'd, I'd rather be dead myself, so that, that attitude kind of took over her. And, uh, you know, call it whatever you want, I don't know, with a fucking multi skits or fucking phrenic or just a, a schizo. But all these, all this animosity going on my head, be all these. Um, attitudes, don't listen to that cunt talking about me, the, the maniac, 
You're getting into a lot of trouble, Johnny. So I'm talking to myself. Don't listen to him, you're getting into trouble. Just get your head down, get, try and get your education, go to your PE, do this and do that. And then the other boys were saying, you fucking, you have no chance, fucking education. You fucking hell, you have a chance you go to school, now you fucking went, now you want to go, now you're there. So it was all this animosity that was going on my head. Aye. And you're not going to talk to, to, turn it, to tell about it, because if you told anybody about the animosity that was going on in your head, you know, people were like, fuck that poor country, I mean, I fucking know who's. Aye, people wouldn't understand yeah, I mean, they wouldn't, they'd never, under, never understand how, 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 how your emotions can, can turn on you, do you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, the only thing that really got me on, I get, I'm getting the hell out of here, man. I'd rather, I'd rather be, I'd rather be fighting against this system because I knew I wouldn't survive that way, way, with all my being. You know, it wasn't. A, it was easier to rebel against that uh, Jordan than it was to accept that. And for one reason, I couldn't accept it anyway, because I, I, my dad's words keep coming back to me. I fucking, one day fucking you'll end up fucking jail for nothing, and you'll fucking rue the day. You remember what I'm telling you. And my wee ma Padden, who, my wee, my wee granny Padden, my ma's mother, we called her ma. She'd been blind since she had her first child, way back, way back in the 30s or something. Right. So she had five kids and a daughter, my mother. And uh, she used to say to me, listen, Johnny boy, when I was younger, gonna, gonna stop running away, so I'm gonna stop doing that and doing this. And you know, because you're out there and we never know what's gonna happen to you. And besides, I need you here, because I want you to be in my eyes and you can do all the, do my reading, my, tell me what's happened, read all the books to me. Mm. And that fucking was a terrible boy to me. That was actually worth the fucking, the 12 year sentence. Uh -huh. To have him to let somebody down like that who had fucking nothing to worry about or the love in the world, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that was fucking sore, you know what I mean? So on top of that, you know, the truth, of, the, the reality of us, he fucked it up, man. He just made a cunt it. I mean, I feel the fucking mess of your life. You know, there's none of your own life. You've got a shrapnel coming after this sentence. It's now affecting your, your family. You know what I mean? And it's only, sometimes you can get a, a brief glimpse at that when you look in the mirror. And you can see, you can see for what it really is, and you you know, fuck, I've fucked it, man. Uh, and you you know there and then if they open this door and let me go, I'll never be back here. Uh -huh, that moment but, of clarity. So that is never gonna ever gonna happen. Yeah. And um, you, you know, and what you see is, some people say have a good look at yourself. You might have a good look at your fucking self in that mirror, but sometimes you can look in that mirror and what you see is fucking frightening. You know, what you see as it goes on is truth. That's if you can look in the mirror. If you can look in mm -hmm. the mirror. And it's easy to fucking see, to put the boot in the mirror once mm. you see what you don't want to see. Mm. And then you've got to hide for the reality of it. So you've got the pain of the reality that, you know, you're, you're, you're just fucking, you just, you're, you're always told you were a hopeless case and fucking I know you, sir. You'll never amount to this and never amount to that. You fucking done, she went to a special school, special school like that. And all these wee hands going back, they fucking to bite you and haunt you, you know what I mean? And then sometimes you're left with uh, the, the, the attitude is, I think I'll fucking just do myself in. But that's just that's just a cry for help. Because uh -huh. um, uh, I was near suicide, I was, I was very near, close to suicide at one point, but I never sat down and contemplated that. Uh -huh. There was a fucking boat of light and come out of the sky and hit me. And, and suddenly I panicked and I was fucking, I think you out here. I don't want to be here. I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't press the bell because if the screws had seen me in the state I was in, I'd have got took the stairs. Yeah. I couldn't get the fucking sheets up on the windy quick enough because I'd have changed my mind. And I, I had one thought: I was going to run and crack my head off the the the, the granite wall in Peterhead Prison. And I've, I'd visions my mum and I've visions them up my fucking funeral. And all, I've visions of a sharp knock off the fucking the the the, the, the notice of my suicide and the pain that would inflict. And I panicked and I've got onto the bell. And I said, I'm gonna need to fucking I'm, I'm gonna need to ask for help here. And that was a fear in its fucking self, because mm -hmm. the only help I could have got, I knew was a big big fucking syringe right in your fucking arse, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Pardon my language. So when the screws come along here from lying in the gallery, and it fucking you couldn't have got that door open quick enough. It was as if I just something it was as if because I was lying in my bed and I was oh, I thought I was reading. I had this book. And then the next thing I'm looking down at myself. And it was as if I was in a week in a matchbox with these wee teeny teeny windies. It was as if I'd been buried underground, but, you know, that's where I was, really. 
and it fucking shocked the life clean. I really had the biggest fright in my fucking life for the first time in my life. You know, I'd been in a lot of trouble, a lot of polo stations, and fucking looked on a lot of bedrooms. But that, when that, when that happened to me that day, that really, I thought I was gone, you know what I mean? Really thought I was gone. So when the screws come along and eventually opened the door, I, I felt calmer. As soon as I opened that door and I seen them, and I didn't want to even fucking see a screw. I didn't like to see any screws, but it was a relief to see somebody out with that concrete box. It just looked as if I'd been buried myself alive, which uh -huh. I literally had done, you know what uh -huh. I mean? So, <clears throat> excuse me, he said, what is it? I said, can I use your toilet? He went, aye, on you go. When I walked along that gallery, I came, I came back down to earth again. Mm -hmm. But what a, what a hell of a fright I got her. Uh. And, and, and I knew I couldn't do the time. I love going to go, oh, you're fucking, you're a wee genius, you can break out yourself and you get all these places. It's fucking, it's not as easy as you think. It's not that you're a genius or you're a, a, or an expert at escaping. <coughs> it's the fucking fear that's within you. No, that desperation. You've got to be desperate, you know, because it's, it's do or die, in a sense, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's do or die, so it was easier for me to rebel, and rebelling kept me alive and kept me kept me up, mm. you know, kept, kept my spirit. Kept you sane as such? <coughs> yeah. Is there a point you were, because I remember you telling me this before, and uh, <coughs> did you say you could hear like, a beeping sound? When I was, at, when I was in the... Uh, when I was in um, Long Again, which was a prison, run by prison officer, prison uniforms, I was 14 years of age when I first got sent there because I'd run away from the prison school uh -huh. and had been remanded by the court right. to be returned, but they put me into Long Again. And, uh, and I was at the dining hall this day. I, I remember I'd blacked out once before when I was a kid. I'd been taken to a shop. It was called Henry Healy's. It was a kind of a delicatessen way back in the day. And uh, and uh, and these shops, all these back in the day, all the coos and all the pigs had all been gutted. Right. They'd all be <coughs> hanging through big hooks. So you could walk into this shop and there'd be three pigs there and three coos and big coos heads hanging up here. Uh -huh. It wasn't a, it wasn't a nice thing to, for you to see, but people uh -huh. would be standing and leaning against these big coos, waiting to get served. <laughs> you know, back in the day. <laughs> So I was in there and I was looking about, and it was just a death chamber, you know what I mean? Aye. And I heard this noise in my ear, this high pitch, mm, and I didn't know what it was, but I, I felt as if I was going to faint. And the people, some said, he's awful white, because I was with an auntie of mine. He's awful white, so they took me outside the shop and they sat me down on these big scales you used to get outside shop doors for weighing yourself, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Put a penny or something in. And I remember feeling a cold on me. Uh, outside this Henry Healy shop, uh -huh. <coughs> so they got me home, got my doctor, and checked me over, everything was fine. So this time along again, this fucking high pitched noise came again, and I felt as if I was going to faint, and I was scared to faint, because it's not the kind of place you want to faint no, when, when, you're, when, when you're in a, a young offenders, young offenders institution, mate, all these screws here, or especially all the cons are about here, mm -hmm. and I fought it. And I felt myself going to go and I fucking, so, it's only years later and I sat down and I thought, it must mean stress. This severe stress that caused me, you know what I mean, because you're, you're, you're trapped, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. you're trapped in a place you can't, you can't be in, it's not as easy to get away from it as it would be in your poor schools or out your house window or it like that. Uh -huh. So it just became, it became, I ended up myself wrapped up in a life that I fucking hated so much that done me fucking nothing, but great, gave me nothing but grief and pain, you know what I mean? And um, and by that time, you know, by then, we were well on the road to being institutionalised, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Although we didn't even know what that meant. I didn't uh, even know what that meant back then, you know. Normal. Uh, the abnormal becomes a normal yeah, then, exactly um, Jordan, that. And, uh, and it was just, just a horrible, just like being in that cell and seeing myself come out my body and looking down. It was just like being in the dining room, but everybody would be wearing battle dress, um, battle dress jackets and um, trousers, uh, navy blue or black, and just everybody doing the same movements. And they just all the one kind of colours. I mean, the striped shirt, robotic it was, and it was just it wasn't it nice to see. You know what I mean? Was, when you compare that to. Walking down Sucky Hall Street and seeing all the beautiful colours and uh, different colours, different people going about their now, lives. Then you find then you find yourself in there 
when you're in a place where you don't want to be, and you know the reason you're there is because of your own stupidity, or even you listen. And um, if somebody could come and talk to you there, and then you could be able to, you may be able to express yourself a wee bit better. Uh -huh. You know, somebody like, imagine if a social worker or something turned uh -huh. up, right, what is the problem here? You could maybe sit down and relax. But it's usually the ones that turn up to the CID, or the fucking police, or the judges, or the uh -huh. PF, and they turn up with a wrong attitude, you know what I mean? Or the turnkey, they turn up with a wrong attitude. And so it's easier to switch off than to confess, you know, to tell your story, to tell. So if you've got any pain or you're, or you're, or you're feeling, I didn't really feel suicidal back then, but you're feeling obviously depressed. I didn't even know what depression was back then. I was just knew I, I was somewhere I didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only me get older and you analyse it and you can see it off or what it really was, you know what I mean? But the other thing is, back in the day, all your social workers would done your bus and poor school reports and social inquiry reports, your screws and turnkeys, the governors, you know, they, they weren't even in a position with an education to pinpoint these kind of signals, these stress signals for kids, or, you know, to see, or they were good for the fucking recommending you for um, further punishment, uh -huh. you know, your reports, you know what I mean? I uh, <coughs> tell you in a poor school, I, I should be sent to a senior poor school, and I've no doubt it'll end up in Boston or Fayetteville or the rest of them. So everybody was tarred with one brush. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, through stress and whatever it may well be, or just through first year carry on, a lot of guys will laugh and a good laugh in the jail, good carry on, a good laugh, but it's a different matter when that door shut. Ah, uh, definitely. On, on you find, title, out, you know I mean? find out. A lot of people, when I've done a bank, <coughs> I've done a programme where I was put, it was a jail experiment and we get put in cells for 10 days essentially, but there was cameras in the cells. <coughs> and there was a lot of side psychiatrist on call psychologist kind of thing and he would say he's like ah, some of the guys when they get locked up you can see them crying but that's that thing you can't come out and show emotion you can't show none of that in the jail because even yeah, in an experiment like that you become a uh, target if you're a wise man and you're educated you'd spot it you know what i mean if me me and you sitting down and i'm a social worker and you're sitting there all cocky and then i i should have learned enough to be able to spot what's underneath you instead of being a cocky attitude and that uh, you know what i mean and that's the way a lot of guys work. It's that bravado thing. You're up for pro, no, I'm a fucking pro, keep it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The bravado thing, isn't it? But then I suppose that's another way that could, uh, maybe the other way of people surviving. That's just words out of my mouth. It's a survival yeah, instinct, isn't it, man? Because that kind of way you kind of, it becomes that rebellion against authority because if you let it beat you down, it will beat you down. And for the period of like 12 years, it's a long time, man. That's, yeah. Some people will be struggling to see the other side of that. Yeah. That's the thing, but if you think, no, I'm rebelling against this, because some people might rebel, people do like sit downs, people go, ah, tell us screws to fuck off, they just they don't obey the rules, there is a kind of to get one up. So yeah. for you, when you had that experience of looking down yourself in the matchbox, as you say, did it occur to you right away, or did the, the thought come, I'm going to do my best to get out of here, or when did, when did you plan your first escape, or was it planned? But when did that come well, about? Only, only when that happened to me, that. Instant I told you what happened to me in the cell block and the in my cell actually in the hall when you're in the cell block. Um only when that happened to me I knew then that I, I could never get through the sentence going to do the time. And I said, Well, you know what? If I don't if I can't fight the system, the system's gonna kill me. Because uh -huh. that was the first time I'd ever that I'd ever I, I used to say to myself, you know, when my pals, there's a good few pals that killed themselves in jail, hung themselves. And the first thing I would say was, oh, fucking idiot. What the fuck did he even go and do that for? Aye. And that's when I realised when that fucking bolt of lightning came to me with a with a suicide tag on it, you don't get time to think about it. It's not as if you go like, oh, fuck it, I'm going to kill myself. What time is it? Four o'clock? Six o'clock. Like, goodbye, cruel world. Aye. You know, and that's when I realised that fucking most people are killing themselves not because they want to. It's the only way they can get away, so... Uh, you it's know, an escape, they don't that, want to die, but they just want to escape their situation. It, it's a mental pain that's worth, it's probably worse than any, you know... Uh -huh. You know, you can imagine, can you get cracked in the head by a truncheon or something, you can go and get the fucking antiseptic jag and get the stitches put in that, but with a psychological pain, that's probably worse than... Uh, than escape, else can, especially in a cell, it's like, I feel it's like a kind of psychological you've, you've microwave no, in a cell because you're stuck in a cell and stuck there. You've not got anybody you can turn to. You've not got uh, there no phones back in the day. All communication took place by a letter, one letter per week per prisoner. And uh, 
you couldn't, uh, you know, like to now, you, you never had a TV or anything like, you need electricity in yourself, you know, it was, it was just like, caveman style. Yeah, you know and I mean? the older cons would yeah. say back when jail was jail. Yeah, but um, the sad and tragic thing is, I know, when I went out to period and, and I was like, fucking hell, what's going on here, man? Because there was a lot of serious contenders up there. Yeah. I got a lot of my dad's, a lot of my dad's pals are up there. And I'm like to myself, why the fuck, man? You're not allowed this, you're not allowed that. You can't do this, you can't go to fucking education, you're your escapee. You can get a newspaper, you can get a radio, and you can't do this and you can't do that. And why, why is, why is every cunt fucking, why is it not just amalgamating all the different, all the different crews or just amalgamate and take care of the whole jail, we can we just walk away, we can fucking make massive changes. And it's only when you get a wee bit wiser and you say, well, Tom, Dick and Harry has got married, and Tom, Dick and Harry's got an attitude of fucking yes sir, no sir, three bag full sir, and fuck you under the, under my breath sir. Uh -huh. So a lot of people with that attitude, just enjoy the boy. This is how you deal with him. Still, get your fucking blanket and get slopped out, or get your bed and get slopped out. Yes sir! And I'm like, fuck, that's crazy, man. It was easy for me to say, go and take a fuck to yourself. Fucking <laughs> empty your fucking self. <laughs> I mean, you fucking angry. And the, the attitude was, who the fuck do you think you are? I'm, I'm only a wee skinny cunt. I'm a fucking eight stone. Uh -huh. so I don't think I'm anybody. You'll fucking never be the da. If you're trying to be like your da, you'll never be the man he was. I'm a fucking old arsehole. <laughs> fucking yes or no, sir, three bags. Don't fucking mention him to me. So they couldn't under understand my attitude. Uh -huh. And I couldn't understand the older conjuries attitude. But when that that was the attitude. Johnny boy, you went to the jail, this is what you do. Head down. Fucking through that sentence as fast as you can. Right out that fucking door. Up there for thinking and down in there for kicking. Down there for kicking in jeweler's windows. <laughs> that was the attitude there. Uh, make as much money as you could. And that had been the attitude. And if, if you were out with if you were out with that attitude in, in their environment or even in their company, you'd probably look upon you as a weak, watery bastard, do you know what I mean? Probably mm -hmm. like a fucking idiot can't do his time. And um, and that's a wrong attitude as well, you know what I mean? But the fact of the matter is, no one can do the time. Mm -hmm. And everybody needs a note. Everybody who's doing time, and back, especially back in the conditions, Jordan, everybody got to have a note. I don't care what it was, what your, what your, what your 40 is. If you're into politics, guitar, or rebelling, or whatever, yeah. whatever you're doing. Even that conforming to the regime, that's in out. Because it's yeah. like, you know, if I get my head down, it'll make the yeah. sentence easier. It's a way of coping. Yeah, so I was, my attitude was, you know, fuck us, I'm not accepting this. And uh, so we got together. Um, a few of us got together, so we forgot we have a riot. Yeah, why not? Let's fucking do it. And it was, it was, it was a relief to have fought against them. You know, there was a lot of really there was a lot of tension. You know what I mean? All that ball of pent up frustration, all that fucking tension. I fucking get messed about slop, big slop, big pushy pots, walking about the galleries, and you know, just living like modern day cavemen, and a system that was put back, put together by some fucking crazy think tank who should have all been in a mental hospital themselves, who could come up with a regime such as we knew it a way back in the day. Um, to think that this was going to make whoever was was in their prisons a better man when they came back out. <laughs> and the whole, the whole idea of putting that system together was, was to break your spirit to deter you if you ever, if you ever re offend again, Jordan. Mm -hmm. that, that was the attitude there. So that, that old prison system of yours was put together way, probably way back in the fucking 17, 18, 1800s. We are, we, we, we are, we are, we are we a think tank who just had nothing but power and money Aye. and just seen us as, as you know, a threat or a danger, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I locked them up and throw away the key. Yeah, so their attitude was um, not a real ballotation, you probably didn't know about real ballotation. Yeah. But they probably they probably didn't know or didn't want to know about being institutionalised, which is a fucking mental illness itself, yeah. you know what I mean? And um, so there was no scope, there was no education, there was no, there was no checks and balances, there was no to pop in you. With, with, all, you all you need to do is look at um, Terry, I mean, Terry Waite, right. way back, maybe fucking 20 or 30 years ago, Terry Waite was a politician who, 
um, traded himself in for a hostage that was taken to the, the uh, Gaddafi regime. He had a British hostage. I think it was a lady, I think she was pregnant. So Terry Waite says, I'll go in her place. And he was held for a couple of years. But he had the Red Cross going every now and again and, and weigh him and check him, check him, check his health. And, <coughs> and this, is, this is, all this information is known to the public. Right. And so, you know, when Terry Waite got released, it was a great thing he got released anyways, you know what I mean? But um, when he got released, before that guy even got off the fucking plane at the airport in London, there was a horde of psychiatrists and psychologists waiting to fucking take him away and debrief him. And yeah, you go to look at you look at the some of the sentences been done to in our own country. <coughs> Guy's been in a long time. There's nobody fucking there to, to debrief you, or take you away and have a look at you, and say, look, let's make sure you're okay from before you get back out the door. Make sure you're fit. You just want that door and fling you out, mm -hmm. and you get flung out there, and you and so you're so messed up with with, with these jail sentences, it becomes a normal part of your life, Aye. you know what I mean, you take it for granted that, you know, third guy saying, ask me away on Tuesday, oh, good luck to you, ah, oh, fuck it, I'll probably see you next week. And that was their attitude, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. it was crazy, you know what yeah. I mean. Then you've got other, you've got other, there's another side that where, I know there was cases where some guy just finished a sentence and um, he's up in front of the judge and I think he'd done, a, I think he'd done an eight year or something, the fella. Up in front of the judge, no parole, no nothing, up in front of the judge, through the, through the street, back up in front of the judge, judge was great. And the judge also made a statement in the paper about that. I'm sick of guys like you, just out of prison, and you're right back in it again, you come out and mere violence. Well, let this be a lesson to the rest it'll be 12 years for you. And the judges don't realise that the fucking damage that the prison system, the regime, is dead to the prisoners who are within its grasp for, for all, all these years, this uh -huh. long term, this long term effect that has on you. And was it PSTD? PS, PTSD. PTSD. And they find out now that we were all suffering for that back then. Uh. And I'm not looking for any, any sympathy on that matter. But I've also learned to think to myself, you know, these screws have got to be, they've got to be suffering for the exact same fucking oh, thing I themselves. Definitely, man, definitely. You know, it's all right saying, oh, he's a fucking dog, he's this, that, and he's that thing. But that was one of the most stressful environments. You were, one of the most stressful environments you were in, as being a being a prisoner and being a prison officer in one, in one of the most dangerous prisons in the country. Cause you never know in a minute. Aye, it was that, that constant anxiety. It was like a war zone. Like a bomb could go off Aye. at any minute, and there might Aye. not be a bomb and since yeah. explosive, but a riot Aye. could just fucking cut. It's not as if some con's going to go up to you, Malari. Like, right, we're going to have a riot at five o'clock. Just be ready. It's like buff. It's mm. on, and then yeah. you could be getting ready to go up the road. And next thing you know, you're having to fucking yeah. drag cunts out and all that shit. It's fucking madness. So we we had the riot. We've, we've stormed the cell block. We've stormed the punishment block, which is in the it's adjacent to the to the to the prison. But Zane Wall, we stormed that, and we took. I think we're up there for three, four days. And the first, this is only the first incident. Okay, I don't need to tell you about the second one. We're up there for three, four days, and it's snowing. It's about Three, three or four below zero, and we've wrecked the place. And and uh, so anyway, cut a long story short, we've, we've broke some of the guys out of out their cells and get them to back her and whatever the case may all set fire to the fucking place. Well, they, the reception went in fire, which is in the punishment block, and the screw says it was us who burnt all the, all the reception, all the clothing, all the reception, and we said that was you that burnt all the. So they blamed us, and we blamed them. So anyway, we got, a, we, got a, we got a terrible smiting after that when we, when we came down, you know, for, for, the, for the rooftop. And uh, as you expect, you're getting, a, you're getting a hell of a fucking baiting, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And we get busted here and busted there and the usual, which you've got to expect. So anyways, um, somebody, somebody smuggled a letter out to, to my dad. And uh, my dad's... My dad and my mum, my mother, I've got the photographs here, front page of the Daily Record. Murder claims brutality, period prison. And uh, a couple of days later, the doctor for the period prison, he's on the front page of some other newspaper and refuted the allegations and denied it all. So, oh, oh Andy, um, he says, get me a pass so I'm coming up to see you. 
So he's come up, and uh, he's like a fucking raging bill, you know. And uh, it was a close visit with a bulletproof glass, me and my brother Jim. And uh, so there's a row of screws, a lot of guards standing behind us. And my dad's and my dad and his pals on one side, and me and Jim's on the other side. And a big row of screws. And uh, so it means my dad's facing the screws. As you're sitting there, if that's you, or you, if you're sitting in a situation where you're, that's me and Jim, my dad's sitting right here. Uh -huh. So as he's talking to us there, he can see there's a big row of screws, and I can hear them laughing and giggling at. Uh -huh. And he said things like fucking arsehole, you know what I mean? Obviously, they felt like my dad who they knew for, for past prison sentence here. Yeah. So he's like, he says, uh, you find it fucking funny days, and uh, they're, they're, they're on the edge, you know. And me and Jim's always on the edge as well. We we, we took for the punishment we walk back up to the visiting room, and uh, and there was a wee bit of to and fro with the with the with the back chat. Oh man, he says, "Yeah, it's fucking funny, ah." He says, "Well, I'll tell you what, we'll do we seem to leave this jail." He says, "I'll be doing the driving. If I fucking see any of you and any of your fucking wings in the street, I'll run right out of the fucking tap room. See how fucking tough you are, ah, assholes." So the right. The screws have kicked off and the fucking, the right bells went and they're trying to get my dad out of the visiting room on this side of it, on the visitor's side. Uh -huh. Me and Jim's trying to kick in the bulletproof glass on our side there uh -huh. and it's kicked off in, in, in the visiting room, you know. So anyway, he um, he went, they charged him, they held him in the, in the, in the jail with the coppers came out and they still threatened him, I'll oh, fucking blow his little dead and dead. The yeah, next thing, and he went to pay the sheriff court, and he was charged with breaching the peace and threatening behaviour. And his response was, I was a bit un hot under the collar when I heard my, my boys get beat up, you know. So he was still at it, he was still fucking there for his, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And as I say, you know, even though he didn't show that much love and affection, when it came to the nitty gritty, he'd put his life in the line for us, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, 100% man. So, and that kind of baffles you, you know what I mean? I thought you'd be, you need to be a fucking Albert Einstein to work that way. Yeah, it's just because you, you think, because I mean? he was the kind of authority figure yeah. that you could possibly argue yeah. that that was the original authority figure that yeah. caused you to rebel in early life, yeah. but when you had slit face, slit brutality, we use that word for other authority figures, he was one yeah. of the ones that always had your back. Yeah. It's a strain to caught me in it. Yeah. So anyway, I get fucking, something happened, I was involved in an incident, I mean, me and Jim got dragged back to the, to the cell block. And I get took to the cages at Inverness. Um, and then I, come, I was there for three months, four months or something. And then I come back to Peter Heed. And I'm in the cell block and I'm getting released for the cell block back into the hall. And uh, I go into the, the work party. And uh, this, this, uh, this guy called Howard Wilson, he was an ex-copper. He was in for killing two coppers in Springburn and Glasgow, mm -hmm. way back in the 60s. So he had a kind of trustee, and he's like, me up with some carry on a minute, Johnny. And I went, well, that's just the way it goes. But I think he's talking about the carry on in the visiting room. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, no, I'm not talking about that. He says, yeah, I'm talking about fucking when, they, when all the screws come running out of jail. I said, what was that? He went, he said, we're on the work party down here. We're in the security part of the tailor shop and doing it what they call the Burma Road, the Admiralty, but the old Peter Head. And you know the old granite fucking old granite shed for way back in the fucking eighteen hundreds or something. Uh -huh. And uh, it's like no, we were all sitting here one day. Next thing, the right bells went, and all the all the all the all the guards on the turnkeys came running out for the work parties, and they were all heading to to the gatehouse. They were running into the fucking street. I said, what the fuck was that? What did I go to do with me? What was that about? They went. They thought it was your dad. It was coming up to fucking to do to do the screws and the and, and the winds. Outside the outside the jail, but it wasn't him. It was always a always a false alarm. But they <laughs> they did take him serious, and they, and they never ever liked him, and they never ever forgave us anyway. They never ever forgave me, nor Jim, and they probably never forgave my dad either. And mm. he was that. Yeah, you got long memories, haven't they, man? Right. So instead of things getting things shouldn't have got any better anyway, because by the time all this shit was going on. Um, there was no, there was never any signs of me ever going to be able to chime my ways by then. And you know, to be quite honest with you, there was times that I, that I, I didn't want to chime my ways. You know what I mean? I was quite comfortable. 
I began to find a, a reason to, to stay alive, quite comfortable to, to burn the place to the ground, uh -huh. quite comfortable to give them a character, throw a pot of shit about them. Uh, and it's no, it's not a good feeling. It's a good feeling. It's a good feeling if you're in that environment, in that situation. But when you come out it and you look back, it's fucking, it was horrible. You know what uh, I mean? Because it was your coping strategy at the time. Horrible. Because see, see when I, you look back at these times where you did like escape for the cell, you done the right and that. See, every time you done these things, was there any intent to escape and disappear, fuck off at the country, or was it just to uh, get out just of to get the cell? Back, just to come out and back and do them. Aye, uh, uh, just to kind of get one up and then that kind of thing, that kind of to and fro. Because we used to sit and talk, we used to sit and talk at the wheel. Yeah, back then, but, yeah, fuck it. just big concrete blocks and, and the punishment block. Oh, your whole your whole cell block and the whole prison were made of concrete. So it was always cold, I mean, you get a fucking a wee hot air vent and never worked, it was years and years of fucking paint over it. We, we hold it, it was meant to hot, it was meant to come out. Same with the fresh air. So, and then you would lose your mattress. If you come, they would take your mattress off you during the day. Say, so, like, right, mattress at, say, half past six in the morning when they come in to open you up there. Uh. Mm -hmm. Right, mattress out when you were mattress going back in at five o'clock. So it was easy to say, hey, the mattress, no problem. Right, mattress in. No, you keep the fucking mattress. No matter of fact, here, take this and off, take the fish pot, boom. Kick the fish pot out, fling it and out. So that in that way, they, you had nothing that they could come in and take off you. Uh -huh. you know what I mean? So we made hammock, well, I, would, I would make a hammock out of bed sheet and tie it to the to one bar, to the next bar, and it would keep me up after the concrete flare. Mm -hmm. Even though the window ledges are at a 45 degree angle, they're much like the old Bellini ones. Uh -huh. And to go on, you'd need to take a runny and jump up, otherwise you would just slide off. Uh -huh. So we end up we we done the windies and we made windies, so we would sleep up there on the hammocks and eat up there on the hammocks, and it was better to be up there you know, eating, sleeping and talking and plotting and planning than to be sitting down there, lying like that, like the four, four walls, you know what uh -huh. I mean? And that's what we used to do, you know, passing the time, having conversations. Like, who's up for an escape? And that'd be coming to the top. Me, 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 that's that the next thing. And then people would say, right, so what are we going to do? What are we going to do? How are we going to get away? And uh, oh, they all would just we need to go and steal a car. And, and there was a couple of guys and it was lying there involved in the conversation and one says, oh, you guys say, I'm not interested in going anywhere, I'm just heading right into Peter Head, right into Agnews, you know, the, on off sales. Uh -huh. And that was the first thing he was thinking about, I'm going right into that fucking Agnews, you know, I'll fucking tell you, I'll, I'll drink coffee that show up dry before they fucking get me out of there. And, and it was funny, you know what I mean, to have that have that kind of humour. Uh -huh. And then there was others talking about what they wanted to do, they would kill us and fucking go and kill the Prime Minister and <laughs> do this and... And a wee guy, a pal of me called Frank McPhee, he didn't know Frank. Frank got, Frank got shot, uh, shot in the head through the high flats in the, somewhere around Mary Hill, I think it was there, uh, with a hit man. So Frank McPhee, Frank was quite a witty guy, he says to me, fucking hell Johnny, he says, can you imagine the BBC were hit, sitting outside their windows right now with their cameras and going like that? Listen, public, just listen to these guys. He said, we've now got fucking out to play again. Well, the punts are all nuts. Mm -hmm. And it was true. We would never get out with our attitude. But it was the fucking system that created that attitude. It created the fucking, created the monsters and us who had that attitude and couldn't survive that, without that attitude. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that was the thing. Frank McPhee was bang on. He said, if the public knew how we were thinking in there, Johnny, we'd have never seen a light of day. Mm -hmm. And, it's, it, and that goes to foot even try to escape. Aye. If you open your mind up, teach her like that, what do you think of I me? Mean, that fucking screw, I've got to fucking up. He did my parole report and fucking every time comes to me, I fucking feel it's fucking put my finger right in his eye, but I've got to be nice to him. You know, that that's the fucking... Mm. Yeah, that's the thing, see the general public, see if like, most people told you like, what they had in their mind, I think you would be surprised. I yeah. think it's in jail, it's, it's a condensed environment, it's high stress. And yeah. the screws, obviously, you can get them. They're just pure cunts. Yeah. No, no, for the most part, but you do, you get, you deal with them. Yeah. Especially if uh, if you're seen as like a problem with them, then you get targeted, you get singled out, and when you're in that cell and you're raging, your emotions are heightened in that. You're angry, yeah. and you, you do go down these yeah. avenues with your thoughts. Yeah. So there was an incident, if I can take you to it, where you were charged with five assaults, and you're taken to court, and you've represented yourself. Can you yeah. tell us about this? What what happened? Yeah. The story. Um, I think it was about 1982 or 83. 
I've got the I've got a newspaper article there. I can text it to you, mm -hmm. and I can back up what I'm sent you uh -huh. via newspaper reports. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I would like to do that anyway, just so that some people will like, yeah, fucking nice. I fact check it. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been in. I hadn't been in cell block about nine months or so, maybe more. Um, it was after a, a bit of trouble, and uh, we end up being we need one day's knee. You know what we wanted them anyway. But we, we end up smashed up, we could smash, we end up no bed, no nothing, left in a hammock. And uh, no tobacco, no, no wee luxes, no wee roll-ups, because nobody would allow it into the punishment block because of the, the condition we had left it in, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So anybody who was going to put in report in the mainstream of the prison had to do their time behind their own cell door in their own hall, do you know what I mean? And even they see that as a punishment, they would see that as a luxury. No, the prisoner, the, the turnkeys are. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, you're always you're always looking to you're always looking to get up to no good. You know, just even even to entertain yourself, if not your fellow colleagues, their prisoners, not knowing uh -huh. that you know you're locked up with. So I was in the exercise yard. Uh, there's three exercise pens, and there's a catwalk on top of the exercise exercise pens. It's an L shaped catwalk. And the screw can come out the door in the middle flat and walk around and look in, down into each pen. You know, into the first pen, it's off the top of the bar wire and then the next one. And up there, and then he goes back in and he can walk back down again and he can come in, maybe say something to one of the screws in, in, the, in the punishment block, shout down the gallery, uh, whatever he's want to say, a cup of coffee or whatever. I mean. So I says to myself, I'm fucking, I'm going to climb out of this fucking thing, I'm going to go and get some tobacco or something. And uh, so I spoke to my pals about it, you know, talking that double dutch, eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going on this roof. And I'm like, how the fuck are you going to do that, Johnny? I said, oh, fucking you watch me. So there's all that razor wire, isn't it, in the, in the prisons, eh? And that wire's, des that wire's designed, Jordan, to, to, cut, to cut you, but also more so to, to tangle you, to catch right, your catch clothing. You know, because there's needles on it as well, you know, apart from the, it's just like razors, isn't it? Uh -huh. And um, and you're going to get cut regardless how you go through it, but you're more liable to get seriously injured or damaged if you get caught going through it with clothing on. Uh -huh. So I took my, I had long johns on. I had a set of long johns, tap, and thing we all joined together, the old cowboy fucking pyjamas. I took them off and threw them, threw them through it. When the screw walked by, the catwalk, to go into the to the bit where he would go down and shout the screws, say for talk's sake, the screw, the guy next door, the next pen, say that, listen, I've had enough and went in, so the screw would need to walk out down and into the hall and shout down to the gallery, uh, number one wants in. Mm -hmm. So when he'd done that, I fucking, I, threw it, I took my clothes off and threw them up through the, through the wire, I landed on the catwalk, and I took a runny, and up, up the two corners of the, of the wall, you know what I mean? The, uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, I went through the wire, got a few cuts, mind you, but I was I wasn't tangled, you know what I mean? And uh, the guys that was up at the Wendy, um, that was on punishment, actually, they were they were fucking cheering and laughing, and you know, it was a bit of bravado, you know what I mean? <coughs> it was a one up them, but nevertheless, I got up and through, went through my bar wire and onto the onto the roof of the, the punishment block, and it was at a time that was um, just after dinner, where there was a nurse exercise yard for the other 200 and 300, 320 prisoners or something. So the football park was full of prisoners, which is a separate, it's got the same big massive gates to get through it, you're not allowed it there with a security prisoner. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the exercise yard in the um, period prison, but it's also got a big wall in it. So the two, the football field and the, and the, and the what do you call it, the exercise yard, in the main part of the prison, we would never, we would never be together unless we were all going through on their way to work. Yeah. But they wouldn't exercise together. Eh? So I'm up, and the first thing I done was get the slates off, started cashing through the, through the windows, the skylight windows there, eh? and uh, <coughs> the riot bells went. I was, I was the screws of pressed the riot bell to let to let the rest of the jail, the staff, not. So what they would do was they would lock the prisoners up 
you get all the prisoners, many prisoners as they can, and then lock the whole jail down till the incident was dealt with. So when they were they were coming for the football field, and I, there's only one door that the cons can get into to get back to the halls, and I've, I'm saying to school, don't don't move. I say you try and put anybody through them, they're going to crack you with these slates. So everybody was held. I was like, I was look, I've done it well. I've got this, I've put my, I put my um, long johns back on, and I'm looking down, and there's a couple hundred prisoners looking up, and it was really, it was really fucking, it was really surreal. Do you know what I mean? Really? It was, um, it was as if, it was as if they were looking up, wishing they could have been with me. And I'm looking down at them, wishing I could have been with them. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was really surreal, it was really strange, you know. And uh, somebody said, What's going on up there, Johnny Boy? And I said, Ah, oh, fucking, just living like modern day cavemen. I said, Listen, don't get any tobacco, fuck off. Ain't you get anybody spare a wee bit of tobacco? So this wee fella, wee Michael Smith, wee Smiddy, uh, he put a tobacco tin and went round the cons. Well, not obviously not a mob, but he ran as many as he could get. And they were all putting tobacco in this back, tobacco then threw up my tobacco, threw up my lighter. So I, I'm on the roof, and because I've got the tobacco then I've let them all in. But mm -hmm. I've, I've shouted into the guys, told them about the conditions and that. And uh, so I'm up on the roof, and the guys up, up at the apex of the roof, and on this side is where they sell windies are for the punishment block. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there's just a sheer drop down into the, into the, the prison um, exercise you have there. Okay. So I'm up at the top, I'm up in the apex, and the guys are like me, Johnny boy, have you got any tobacco? I say, aye. So I, I climbed down to, the gutters are massive. Uh -huh. there, there's a big cast iron gutters there. Uh -huh. So about 10 years could swing from it, it's never, it's never going to budge, you know what I mean? Right. So I was making roll ups and putting bits of tobacco in, whatever, and hanging for the gutter and putting it into, they would put a hundred to sell one day, and I would pass the tobacco in on there. Uh -huh. So anyway, somebody shouting at the cell one day, Johnny boy, they're coming, they're coming with ladders, they're coming to get you. And I said, aye, that's okay, I won't be going anywhere. And they, uh, I've got the slates off, and I see the ladders coming up for the cell block one day side, uh -huh. you know, for the, no for the exercise, exercise yard side. So I said to the school, look, I said, what, what's going on? And he's like, I will come to get you. I said, well, you know, it's up yourself. I said, but you, you're not equipped to come and get anybody. I said, you fucking put yourself, your life in danger and put my life in danger. I said, you've not got a fucking harness. I said, what do you think you're going to do? Just come up here and fucking drag me off. I said, you've got to come with me. I will come to get you anyway. I said, well, it's up yourself. I said, but I'm just telling you what's going to be happening. So anyway, I've run the slates off and I'm not saying I didn't fling any slates at them. I threw as many as I could at them. And uh, so that this 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 turnkey, this turnkey um, guy called Richie McGill, he was a fisherman before he became a became a, a turnkey. And uh, the thing about Richie McGill was, I never had any reason ever to have any animosity with this fella, right? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you the reason why. We've seen my dad get to jail at the visit mm -hmm. for threatening to kill her or her, kill his girl's family or mm -hmm. whatever. Well. Some sometime thereafter, maybe about six, eight months thereafter, my dad died, right? So me and Jim gets fucking called into the governor's office this day, when the whole jail was locked up. And I looked out and I went, it's fucking around Jim. Fucking all these screws here for man. And we're all fucking we're all on edge, you are talking maybe about fucking forty, fifty of them. What the fuck's going on? And we get into there's a team outside the governor's order room. And uh, we get in, and uh, uh, Chief Chief Warder's sitting there, and he's fucking got this paper in his hand, and I can see him he's shaking, like yawn, you know. And I was like, what the fuck, man, is going on here? And I'm really fucking, really, really concerned, because I'm thinking, the worst I'm thinking, my fucking poor mother, you know what I mean? And, uh, oh, bad news for you, guys, just tell you that your father, Mr. Andrew Steele, well, that was a fucking relief, do you know what I mean? To me, that it was him that died, my dad, you know what I mean? But instead of your mum? Aye, oh, oh fuck. Right. So you thought it was your mum that was the, died? I, I couldn't think straight, but, uh -huh. I, you know, I just couldn't think straight. And I'm saying to myself, I'm saying to Jim, fucking hell, I saw him out of the screws. So I think no respect, I used to kick, kick off Johnny. 
And he says, uh, um, I'm really sorry to pass this message. I say, so you fucking are. Fucking realize you fucking yelled the guy fucking us a while ago. Mm -hmm. Fucking beating his boys up. Don't get this fucking, you've told us what it is, so let's fucking just leave it at that. So anyways, he said, we'll get back to you like no, but if you know. And uh, so we get back to the governor, I think Governor Alfie Smith. He said, listen, he said, I've got some bad news for you. I said, fucking hell, what is it now? He says, I can't find any my staff to take you, take you to, to your dad's funeral. Uh -huh. I said, how can you find any? He said, because I fucking don't want to take you, I don't want to go. He says, because of that incident with your dad threatened to, to kill the staff, sons and daughters and whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, or burn them, fucking blow their hisses up. So, therefore, we can't take you. You don't need to go to Blinney. So if we need to go to Blinney, we've already been fucking granted immunity for Blinney for the sake of the estate for Scotland because of the escape. I said, we've been granted immunity by the CID, the Procurator Fisco, and the Secretary, Secretary of State for Scotland, granted immunity because we're lives were in danger because of the fucking turnkeys that took the bribes and they want us to give the information to put them in. Mm -hmm. So and we're not fucking going to go to Blinney, right? so we can get fucking things swinging for bars and fucking happening. You know what, just fucking, just forget it, we'll make rain right in the fucking funeral. So the governor's like, oh, we don't want to go through all this. I said, well, we don't want to fucking Blinney. So, so telling us, none of the screws up here will take, take us to, to my dad's funeral. <coughs> he said, that's right, Johnny. He says, I don't know where to go. No, no, not one fucking screw. I said, well, okay then, fuck it, forget it, doesn't matter. So anyway, he calls us back up again and he says, look, he said, I found, uh, we found six, six officers, Johnny, me and Jim, six officers that haven't had any trouble with you. Never even fucking dealt with you in any way whatsoever. Who are willing to, to take you to the funeral. And they'll, and, they'll be, and they'll be dressed in civilian clothing because they know what kind of funeral they're going to be. And uh, we know what kind of people are going to be at you know. So that's, that's as far as I can daisy, but you're, you're always under a police escort, means you've got there. God, we've got escapees and they uh, escape for, for the jail, you know. So, so we go to the chapel and the service is fucking over and done me. And they were, we're in the back of the polos. The, the, the jail bus and um, the screws at that time it took us out had let my mother into the van to sit with me and Jim mm -hmm. which was, was quite decent I mean it was, it was unusual you know what I mean for me to do that mm -hmm. and of course we're comforted by my mother and plus all our family was surrounding the fucking van and people try to talk to you and people try to chat Wendy's and so the screws were going to be a bit on edge you know what I mean mm -hmm. and uh, so anyway back to what I was talking about I'm looking and somebody shouting, watch your back, Johnny boy. And I look so I looks over and I see see this fucking see this guard coming towards me and he's got his truncheon. He's got his truncheon out and he's fucking trying he's coming on a big long corridor on top of close to the building that I can't even do it, sorry. So he's trying to jump the way I was jumping about just like a fucking wallaby, a kangaroo. Mm -hmm. Fit as fuck I was when I was young, you know, mm -hmm. you know, really strong, but it's all energy and wiry. Probably, probably fucking, I probably nervous energy, <laughs> but really strong and wiry, yeah. not an acrobat. And uh, so I, I went fucking hell, man. I says, look, we we up to, and he went, you're coming down. I went, I even fucking go. And everybody's looking at the, all the cons can look at the one day and onto this onto this incident. You know what I mean? Well, not everybody, but one whole hall. One full side of a, 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 a jail hall can, can look out and see what's going to happen because they're shouting out the window to me, yeah? Uh -huh. And I went, oh, fucking hell, man. I said, look. I said, don't fucking spoil this, man. I said, I'm not going down. I said, you ain't going to take me down. Anybody can come up and try to take me down. I said, they'll fucking come right after me. I could, I'd rather come off the fucking roof with one of you than come down myself. And it was one of the screws that took us to the, to the funeral. I went, fucking hell, man. I said, look. I'll fucking be better respect for you, but don't fucking think you're going to come up here and manhandle me. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the fuck you're trying to impress. I can't even go on. Then we had a bit of bolt that I'd found up there, that probably in the gutter or something. Like a, I don't know what the fuck it was, but a bit of metal anyway, a bit of bolt. 
So this cunt's got his fucking trunch in it and he's, he's thinking of circling me. And I was like, look, I don't fucking want any hassle, man. I said, you done me proud when you took me to my dad's funeral. And I said, I'll never forget that. I said, you probably only want out of fucking, only six years out of the whole, whole prison who, who had the fucking gumption and the backbone to do it. Yeah. I said, for that reason, I don't really want any trouble. Anyway, he's, he's trying to bounce there this fucking, this wire. I went, oh, fucking hell, man. You know what? Fucking get the fuck. So I've cracked him and he's decked it. And uh, he's on all fours. So I've just turned and walked away and back onto, back onto the ap apex of the fucking cell block roof. Mm -hmm. And then other screws are trying to come up ladders, so I'm flinging as many slates as I can at them. So anyway, eventually I've gone down, down my inner cord, because I was cut making it through the, through the barbed wire. So they're like, look, you need to go down and get yourself to the surgery. Get yourself cleaned up, we'll give you an anti tetanus and fucking give me you come near me with a needle. You can clean it up if you want, but you're not coming near with a needle. So I go there later and the fucking comes to the court case. And uh, a lawyer comes to me in the court and says, hey, how you doing? She says, uh, I'm a duty free lawyer. He said, uh, I'm here to represent you. I said, you fuck. He says, you? I said, I know you. I remember you for the fucking, for the riot. This was the second riot, exact same as the first kind of riot we had okay. there. I remember you for the, for the riot. I said, um, guaranteeing oh, us that we came off the roof that there'd be any brutality. And I said, it turns out you're a fucking liar. I said, my mother had to go to the newspapers about it. I said, so you're not defending me. I, I, I'm free. I said, I don't give a fuck. I said, you're not, you're not I, I would rather represent myself than, than as, as, as fucking let you represent me. Get yourself to fuck. So the uh, judge is like that. He says, um, hey, are you a solicitor? And I went, what, a solicitor? Why? I said, what? And I told the judge the story. You're a fucking liar. I said, and I told him about the, the right period. I said, yeah. you can't you know, I'm going to get um, a free pass. Maybe we'll get in. Mm -hmm. It turns out we all get lettered. The majority is anyway. He said, well, you know, he says, uh, quite a bit of hard work to get involved here and do your own thing. I said, well, I'm prepared to do it. It's fucking hard work being alive in there, man. You know, don't underestimate the situation. I'm prepared to do it. So he says, right, OK, then. He said, we'll bring you back here next week to see where we are. So I goes back to the jail and goes to the governor, Big Alfie Smith. I says, I need a, I need a list. I need a... I need uh, access to my, my witnesses. I need to interview them. You'll not be interviewing anybody in my prison, he says. I say, is that right? I say, okay then. Wait, go back to court. I said, I'll be telling the judge exactly what you said. I said, no matter of fact, you get incited as a fucking witness for trying to interfere with the fucking courts or the, the justice system. Um, trying to fucking tell me that I can't get my witnesses. Who the fuck do you think you are? Way back to court, I said, I'm being denied access to my witnesses. He said, well, we need PF Euro to deal with us. Get in touch with the prison. He says, if you give the, if you give the procurator, fiscal, procurator fiscal a list of your witnesses, he says, then the procurator fiscal will get in touch with the governor. So anyways, the, the, um, the governor come back to me. I, I, I've got my witness, his witness room, or my witness room, I looked at, in mm -hmm. the jail, it was his orderly room, this was where the punishment took right. place, aye. So anyway, he's like, right, Steele, and he, his face was stripping me, you know, he will be fucking, wasn't he? He wasn't too happy. And I said, uh, he said, right, you've got your, you've got all your witnesses, he says, uh, and we'll, they'll be coming down here at whatever time that we had, they, they had arranged for them to be down there. So, and in the order room, it's a big table, and the door, to the order room has got a wee glass patch on uh, it, you know. A window? Aye. And I'm looking and I can just see the big slanty face that I said, get the fuck. Fucking get away for the get away for the, the door. Fucking stand in the heavy wagon. So get away. And uh, I said oh, otherwise I'll just put this on hold and go back to the court again. Mm -hmm. So the governor can see what's the problem. I said stand in the heavy wagon. So we'd already searched it. I'd already turned the place up that side down anyway, looking for bugs and checking the fucking light bulb and, you know, in case they were sitting tuned in, yes. Uh -huh. Which I wouldn't have put it by, let me do that. So anyway, 
I've got my mind. This is in there, and I'm like, I said, you know, you, you know, now you were saying that you seen this happening, you seen that happening. Like, Aye, so that was me. I had to tell lies. I had to get my witnesses in to tell lies, to get me to realise that the screws were telling me with me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, was, that's that's the way. Uh -huh. That's the truth of the matter. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And uh, so I concocted the story. The story with other about eight witnesses. I've got a newspaper article in about tells you. I find it myself and gives you, I gives you, mentioned the witnesses in there that come in and. Spoke up on behalf of her. In fact, the guy came through here, um, Jad Sweeney, came through here um, a couple of months ago. And uh, he said, I've got to be busy. I said, oh, fucking brilliant, Jad. And he, I was looking at the earth, so I was waiting for the earth, the earth, same place. And I fucking, I was, my God, man, this is fucking surreal, man. And the last time I sat down and spoke to Jazz was in the Governor's Order Room. Was he one of the witnesses? He was one of the witnesses. Was he, yeah. I, I said, see there, your wee article. I got for the for the newspaper, uh -huh. for way way back uh -huh. there. I'll send you, I'll send you a wee copy. Of it. Uh, so anyway, I'm concocting my story up. Um, obviously, they're not going to say they seen me throwing any slates or whatever, but the schools are saying that they threw threw slates and some of them were injured, and seen me hitting the hitting the other guy McGill with, with a bolt or some of them. So, because I'm defending myself, I'm in. Uh, the, the 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 crown bring their they bring oh, their case first forward right they bring uh -huh. us forward first rather. so they've got their their witnesses <coughs> so I've got a copy I've got a copy of their statements I only got them in way the promise that I made to them that I would give them a copy of my mm -hmm. my prisoners my prisoner my pal statements there so so I had access to what they were going to say when the, when the PF says to me. Uh, what about the statements you were going to use? I said, oh, I'll have me to the governor, I, I, would, I need to bring them in. They're saying, you know, fucking take that into court. You've had enough leeway, and you'll be taking it. I said, but it's, it's the statements for the prosecutor fiscal, you know, you'll not be getting them. He, he never said that, I just said that to create a, create a problem, you uh. know what I mean? You wouldn't, you wouldn't get them anyway, yeah, Jordan. So, this, this guy comes in, one of the guys, one of, one of the turnkeys come in. And he says, I'll put a ladder up against the the, the, the wall. The steel was on the roof, he climbed at the pen. We got a radio call saying that a prisoner <coughs> a prisoner escaped for the pen. It turns out it was him. He says he just randomly started throwing slates. Which I did, but only because they were making an attempt to climb the ladder. Uh -huh. you know I mean And well I didn't start throwing them right away anyway. I says, No, don't come up. I says it was gonna end up with hurting and but they mean listen, you know. Uh -huh. So, this guy says, I threw a slate. I'm about 30, 40 feet above them, bearing in mind that. <coughs> and these slates are, these slates are bigger than the laptop. These things are massive. Uh -huh. you, you can back, you can back like hundreds of years. Uh -huh. and these things were, were, took out a quarry and, and, and pieced together and chiseled. Mm -hmm. So you're talking really serious, serious slates. Nothing like the slates these days, as you can imagine, Jordan. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen them anyway, uh -huh. you know what I mean? So, this guy's like, he had a slate, he said, a slate just missed my head, head hurling towards me, and done me in the leg. He says, eh, severely injured. I said, oh, I, you're right. I said, so, how long we have work? Months. You got a sick line. <laughs> He's like, what? I said, you got a sick line? He said, I, mean, I don't need to answer that. I'm only asking you, you got a sick line. I say then, the truth of the matter is, I don't believe a word you're saying. There's no truth in that. And you don't expect anybody else to believe that, for that matter. So you're trying to convince us that this slate was fucking probably about this size. They had, them, they had the productions in the court, uh -huh. the exhibits there. So, and because I'm defending myself, I'm saying to the... I say to the prosecutor first, cause I, I was standing in front of the jury, uh -huh. basically to summon up there. I had a wee cold sore, Jordan, and you've got a wee cold sore and you're trying to talk and it's nippy. Uh -huh. And you, you're talking like, try to f f f f try to move your lips so uh -huh. that it won't, won't, won't bite. And the judge, you like, I said, I don't even think I can hear a word you're saying now. I said, I've got a cold sore here. I said, well, why can I not stand outside there? 
sitting in front of the jury, the way the property of Fisco did. I said, I've got a cold so I can hardly talk myself. He went, oh, he said, well, anybody object? And the property of Fisco says, no. So I'm standing at the... Uh, I'm standing in front of the, the jury, and they're sitting right there on the benches there, two rows of them. And um, I was sitting to this witness at first anyway, I said, you know what, you're a liar. I said, you're not in the governor's order room now, you can come in and just talk a lot of crap, and you're going to be believed. I said, you're trying to say that this slate came from 40 feet. If I, if I had came from 40, 40 feet with the weight of this slate, I had to at least fucking slice you open. Mm. When you just left a bruise. I said, you know what, I can get out of the box anyway. And the judge is like, what? I says, out. I want him out, out my box. I says, you're talking a lot of crap. I know nothing further to say to you. The judge says, mm, you sure? And I said, fucking a liar. I said, I'm not going to sit here and listen to his crap. <laughs> fucking cut a, a, a fucking bruise in your life up for months. I said, nah, out. So he got put to the back of the court. <coughs> I'm already sitting there. I'm already sitting there between two screws. Handcuffed. So they unhandcuffed me to go and speak to the front of the jury, yeah. Uh -huh. And then the next, the next guy comes in, he's like, yeah, yeah, I was going up this side of the ladder, and then this slate came off and, and got through with him and struck me. He was off what for months, sir. I went, really? So these slates are lying in the fucking the big table. And, uh, and I, I'm on to it, you know what I mean? And I've already fucking, I've already got, I've already got word in for the, for the hall. Can I defend myself mm -hmm. in, the th in the third day? I think I trial one for five days. In the third day of the trial, my brother Jim shouts, Johnny boy, he shouts for the cell block, he shouts for the hall, down into the punishment block. He says, it's in the newspapers and on the radio saying that you're a fucking killer and a murderer. I went, really? And he went, aye. He said, right, okay, Jim. So the next day he goes into court. And I said, I'd like to bring something to the court's attention here. Jury sitting there, I said, I ain't a murderer and I ain't a killer. Because I was a killer in one newspaper and a murderer in another newspaper. That was the, the phrase you used. Mm -hmm. I said, I've never deprived a man of oxygen in my life. So the judge, what's happening here? He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, what's going on? He said, is this true? I said, it's in the newspaper referring to me as a killer. I said, it's a load of shit. So the the judge says, right, wait, 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 he says, we need to put the jury out. He says, this, this, the jury's got to be put, so they put the jury out. He's like to the, to the PF, have you seen this, this article? That cunt say his eye. He wasn't here for fucking cracking the light, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. He went, yes, I said, really? Fucking clever, eh? So the judge says, right, I want the, look, I might be going to recess to two o'clock. I want the, the reporter who purported this matter in the newspapers, I want them in my court by two o'clock. You make sure that happens and I'll deal with this matter. So they brought the jury back in. They said, Look, there was something I had to be explained. It was nothing to do with the jury. And if you'd have heard anything, um, read it in any articles or newspapers, <coughs> put them to the back of your mind. You mm -hmm. see, it didn't concern the trial. So, the next day, this, this guy, my girl, comes in. I'm putting him in the back of the court, so we've got two screws sitting either side of me, and there's screws sitting behind them for security for the prison, uh -huh. and plus you've got the fucking turnkeys for the for the court itself. Aye. So there's probably about eight of them sitting behind me. And I'm cross examining this guy, my girl, who took me out to my dad's funeral, and uh, I can hear the giggling. I turn around and I'm looking at the I'm looking at the screws, the row of screws behind me. And I know I, I know the jury's on to it, I know the court's on to it, they can fucking you can hear them, you know what I mean? There's snide comments. So I turn around and I say, I'm glad you find it fucking funny, eh? Very clever. Eh, fucking clever. Eh, sitting giggling at the back of the court, making a mockery of the court, no respect for yourself and nobody else, and you're not in the governor's order room now. So the judge went like, hmm. And he served the, the clerk a coat over, the clerk, the sheriff clerk over, and whispered to the sheriff clerk. And she turns in <coughs> and goes like, yeah, I think there's too many people at the back of the court. So they all get put out the fucking court. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I, 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 I done it deliberate, because I knew 
you know, I knew they were fucking showing themselves up for the fucking stupid that were dead, you know what I mean? Making a mockery of the court, mm -hmm. which went in my favour anyway. So this guy, McGill, he's telling, he's telling his story that fucking, yeah, I was going over this wire and I was doing this and I was doing that. He says, and just as I was going over the last hurdle to get him, he said, I tripped and landed on all fours and I struck him in the head with, with what he appeared to be a bolt or a similar incident. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, you're a fucking liar, man. I said, what's wrong with you? The fucking, what do you need to come in and tell stupid lies for? I waited till you were on all fours. I said, that's bullshit. I said, you know you're lying. I said, and you know what? I would have never done that to you. And the reason being, because what you done when you decided that you were going to be one of the few who took us out to my dad's funeral when my dad died. Mm -hmm. And because my dad threatened to, to, to attack your families at, at, at the prison after the brutality, after the beatings we got. Mm. I said, you took me to my dad's funeral. You were one of the few, and I had nothing but respect for you. I said, you know what? I wish the best I fucking stuck the boat in your head. You know that? Did you say that to him in the court? But, he, but he, what he did was, he tried to make out he'd fell on all fours. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, don't fucking do this, man. Because cunts were shouting at the window, kill that cunt, Johnny, throw him off the roof. And I'm like, fucking hell, man. And I've still got this wee bit of respect for him. Yeah. You know, because of what he'd done, that. So I went, you know what? Get out the fucking box. Get out. Out! The judge is like, whoa, he said, you, you need to cross examine him. I said, fucking, he's a liar. Get him out. Out the box. So the judge is like, well, somebody's going to need to cross examine him. He said, you can fucking fling all your witnesses <laughs> out the box. I said, I could all think they're in the governor's order room. I said, that ain't the case. They get away with all that shit in there. They come in here and make a mock of the court. They just come in here to tell them life for the fucking sake of it to try and get me another another charge on top. So anyway, and then there was another incident that happened. There was the three charges put together. That was the three for the for the assaults. And the 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 guy three the, the three of them, the two assaults for the for the slates and the slate. There was another two charges for fighting with the screws in the, in the punishment block itself, um, which took place. I was only prisoner out there, slopping it when I tore off the fucking toilet system and started fighting with them, trying to barricade myself. Mm -hmm. But I ended up. So, anyways, it was during the summing up, and uh, I says to the judge, "He's on the block. I can hardly hear you. I'm fucking try to put you off." And I mean, I said, "I've got so so here, so so here, right here. I can fucking hardly talk myself." I said, would you mind if I come out and stand in front of the jury, just the way he does, the prosecutor Fisco? And I knew that cunt was shaking, Jordan, because he, he was talking to the jury with his hand behind his back and he had a piece of paper, and the fucking piece of paper was flapping up. <laughs> I knew he was kind of nervous, aye. Yeah. So anyway, I said, can I go out there and talk to him? And he went, well, if anybody's not got any objections, I don't see why not. So I'm out, and I'm laughing to the, in fact, you know, laugh again. I better tell you this bit beforehand, so that it's a sheriff and jury. Right, so we're just going to swear the jury and this is the prosecutor fiscal. And the place is in silence when he's telling me this. He says, um, you know, you can object to one in one in three members of the jury who whose name I call. Mm -hmm. Can it tells you their occupation beside that? Right. So I'm on to it right now and and I said, you know what? Why would I want to object to anybody? Well, I don't know. Even you could um, one could be a housewife. You maybe prefer that, or one may well be a one could be a doctor. You might not hear that, no want that. I'm like, I say, really? I say, well, I ain't objecting to anybody. I say, could you all a bunch of decent human beings to me? I say, so I've not got any reason to object to anybody regardless of their occupation. So you can forget it. He said, well, so you're going to need to object. I say, I don't need to object to anybody. I say, look at them. What, what do you see that I can't see? There are people waiting to get picked in the jury to hear a crappy trial. I say, and you're asking me to object to who I want to sit on the jury. It's no, it's not my place eh? to object to anybody. Uh -huh. You're picking them, my peers. I say, so I don't object to anybody, and I won't, and I never done that. Eh? So anyway, I'm standing there, and uh, summing up, and I would like to tell the judge, I mean, I stand it down the middle of the maybe he's objecting on you go. So I went. I said, and I was talking about the, the, the guys with the slates. Now, I've never heard so much crap in all my life. And uh, I said, I'm going to prove something to you. 
So there was this fella sitting in the in the jury, he probably the biggest bulk but all the members that was in the jury are. Big stocky guy, big bohead, like a big farmer type fella. Mm -hmm. And I says, uh, hey Rona, I said, do you mind if I can get one of these slates over, or possibly the two of them? He went, what? I said, I need to see these slates. He said, what do you want the slates for? I said, well, I want to speak to the jury, I want the jury to see them and feel them. He went, hmm, anybody had objections? And nobody objected. So this fucking PF, he's held me this big slate. I went, go, wrap it in a bit of paper at least, man. Put a, put a sheet of paper on it. I said, can I go to hand this to the jury? And uh, he, he, he went and got a, an A4 bit of paper and he put it over it. Uh. So I would like to the jury. I said, listen to the gentlemen jury. They proved me on the reason without that these guys are telling lies when they say you get a hook with these slates. I said, you feel the weight of this? I said, I'm going to pass it to you, sir. He was the biggest guy. Mm -hmm. He was sitting right at the front there. I'm going to pass it to you, sir. I says, and you tell me, you never mind this coming down for 40 feet above you, you know, coming down at me from that, that speed. I says, for where I'm standing, and if I took the decision to hit you with a slate for where I'm standing, would you expect just to have a bruise? I said, and with that, I'm going to hand you the slate. And he sold this fucking, I've got, I've got the biggest slate you could ever think of. <laughs> And I, he says, no, nah. he's shaking his head. And I went, could you pass that slate to every member of the jury, please? And uh, and exactly what he done. So the the judge found me found me three not guilty on the three series, three years assault charges, mm -hmm. and two fucking two two lesser charges he piped me the screws in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the toilet. So. The when the trial finishes, Jordan, when your trial finishes under these circumstances in the prison and in internal, internally, if you're an outside court, when you come back and your trial's finished, you go back into the norm, you go back into circulation. Right. But if it's an, if it's an internal charge, they can put you onto Rule 36 and further Rule 36 to keep you even longer. So anyway, they brought the they brought the reporter in. They brought the wee reporter in who the judge says, I want him in my court. So he's sitting in the dock with me. And uh, and I'm sitting there like, who what the hell happened there? Man? I said, when you get out of that crap for fucking I was a killer. <laughs> I was a killer and a fucking murderer. Fucking disgusting <laughs> man. I was never deprived anybody of in my life. Even it was him that told me and he threw his, his thumb back. And it was a, uh, it was the fucking, it was the thumb piece I was talking about. <laughs> and uh, the the judge says the, he, the guy, the reporter obviously had a, a QC for the newspapers, um, representing them, and he told the his QC told the the, the judge at the court that um, it, my my client took a brainstorm, but as an actual fact, he told me. It was the fucking screw that says that murdering bastards assaulting our staff. And uh, he got a thousand pound fine, I got a five pound, comp a five hundred pound compensation. Aye, right. <laughs> I did, John, man. Fucking hell. That is, so, I think that's hilarious, man, see what the fact that a newspaper, I think he had a lot of fucking derogatory stuff. No. Newspaper reporters write, this guy's wrote it, and the next day he's in the dock with the guy's wrote it, but he must have been like, what the fuck's happening here? Yeah. <laughs> must have been so surreal. Yeah, so when I got the. When I got the verdict, and the judge was then summed up, they said, I think Mr. Steele represented himself very well indeed. And uh, he gave me four months. Four months. Uh, but the other series charges were dropped, eh? Mm. You got yourself out of all, man. Aye. And uh, so I goes back to, back to Peter Heed. Did I fuck? And I even got back to Peter Heed. Right outside the Sheriff Court. Front of a big, big van, a big transit van, uh, eight screws in it, right to the end of the cages. Fucking took me right to the cage, I don't even locked up at fucking 12 months by this time. So, I up the lines in the cages, and they've got to, they've got to get permission off the Secretary of State for Scotland to, to keep you in the cages, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I arrived up there, and I says to the wee governor up there, I said, what the hell is going on here? See, I'm meant to go back into circulation. 
I said, well, it's nothing to do with me, Snail. He said, it's not your governor. I said, well, I haven't walked up for now one a year now. I said, so what the hell's going on? I said, why am I, why are they sent here? And the only reason they sent me there, because they were a laughing stock in the fucking jail, because all the cons were all killed. Because they were too busy running about all that. He will never handle himself in that court. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, he got him. one up on them. I uh, one up on them, eh? And I come back for the, for the, for the cages. And uh, the school says to me in the punishment block, the governor wants to see you before you go, Snail. He's like, are you, you going to conform me? I'll let you back up the stairs. I'm a fuck. I'm fucking not. I just answer my conforming. I said, you don't even ask me to fucking go there. What, you're not going to conform? I said, no, I'm a fuck. He said, well, I, don't, I don't need to let you upstairs. I'm a fucking, I'm a fucking, I don't fucking, I wanted up the stairs. He said, well, you just end up in trouble. I said, I don't give a fuck. I end up in trouble down here. I don't, I don't need to go upstairs and end up in trouble. He said, I don't give a fuck. He said, oh, you've, you've pulled a lot of bull, you've pulled the bull over a lot of people's eyes. <laughs> <coughs> and I said, no, you fucking made a cunt of yourself. <laughs> Funny people's eyes, we're going to get your staff in to tell lies. When you go in your cage, you're not allowed, you're not allowed a bar of soap in your cage. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed a toothbrush. You're not allowed a comb. You're not allowed a pen. You get your pen when you're writing your letter, and then it comes clean back half you. You get your comb and your toothbrush and your shaving gear when you're going for a shower, mm -hmm. which is outside the cage, okay. and outside in the corridor, and a wee cubicle in there. And uh, what was the point I was going to make you there? Aye. So I says, uh, you know, when I was in the fucking cage, I said, I'm pacing up and down like a fucking, like mongoose, pacing up and fucking back and forward. And I got that good at it, I could date with my eyes shut, ten paces here, uh, so about turn, I mean, or eight paces. That the, you know? the small space you had. <coughs> so I was saying, you know, every time I was stopping and turning round to walk back again, and my eyes were open, I could see my, I could see myself in the mirror, because there was a mirror outside your case on the wall. Aye. Your cage, right outside the other. Okay. And uh, somebody says to me, I don't believe that. You're in a cage and you've got a mirror outside, so you're look, looking in the mirror. You can see yourself in the cage. And I said, that's right, yeah. And I knew a photograph existed, right? It is fucking particular. But I'm telling you about right now. Uh -huh. And I've got the photograph there. I fucking eventually found it. But I knew it existed years ago because I seen it. I was in the fucking cages and I was reading it. One of the screws, um, a guy called, um, his name will come back to me. He was a wee tough cunt, came from one of the islands. Uh, there's a photograph of him. He's outside the cage, right? The cage door, he's got the cage door open. Okay. And obviously the reporter for the newspaper that was in the... He was sitting, he's sitting inside the cage, right? Okay. So I took this photograph, and lo and behold, what's behind the fucking screw's back? The mirror. The mirror on the wall, <laughs> oh, fucking yes. Because it does, uh, they kind of things did annoy me. I said, well, fucking, I, I would imagine, you know, if somebody else was telling me that story, and it was, a lot of it sounds far-fetched, you know what I mean? And fucking what? People don't believe me. Mm. And it's always good to have that. Uh, I have the backup, because you know I mean? it's see Back then, when you look back at it, you telling me it, because I've experienced prison in a totally different era. When you look yeah. back at that, it's like almost as medieval as such, yeah. when you're in a cell that's yeah. got a cage in it, and yeah. that's it, that's all you've got, yeah. and you don't get given it into the cell. Yeah. It's like these days, it's unheard though. Barra O'Neill, that's the screw's name. Barra O'Neill? Aye, uh, do you know why they called him Barra O'Neill? Why? Because he stayed in the, he was brought up in the island of Barra. Right, okay. His name was O'Neill. Barra O'Neill. Uh, aye, and the other thing was, up there, all the screws that was in the cages, seem to be exercising or whatever, mm -hmm. they all spoke Gaelic. Then they speak the English language. But they didn't, they didn't speak English nah. at all? No. Nah. Ah, they did. But they just but didn't in front of you. So yours. that was their own kind of codes. Aye, so they would. They would we, 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 we'd be talking double Dutch, you know what I mean? They'd like, <laughs> be talking Gaelic. They'd be like, oh, I think we're, think we're spraking German. I think it's double Dutch sound, and there's a lot of Scottish words that sound German as well. Eh? Uh -huh. And uh, so they would use the Gaelic. And we knew obviously probably you know, were fucking character, you know what I mean? And then we were doing the exact same with them. Uh. But I mean we were talking double Dutch and then some daft cunt came up, we told Alec come on, he started going, Weggy, Weggy, Gaggy, it's how get him then. He started talking Eggy language, so fucking hell the wind's know that too, man. <laughs> <laughs> he, he thought he was name great enough. Fucking hell man. Try to get bilingual and exercise here. I told James Ingalls about the story off off. I mean, as an off the podcast, when we were talking on the phone, 
I was telling them a story about Farrah McDonald. He's like, fucking hell, Jonah, it's remarkable. So, and then I phoned him. He says, Johnny, he says, look, can we, can I take you to Farrah McDonald's? I'd like you go up and fucking interview the priest. I went, I said, I could phone him. I said, I know he's got cancer. I said, but I can phone my sister. I'll speak, I'll speak away to him. Oh, I'd love to fucking be great to get him and get that fucking bit of paper off him. So I phones up. And it ring, 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 ring. I was like, Lorna. I said, I've got a bad feeling, Lorna. She went, how? I said, it didn't usually take as, as long to answer. So anyway, we knew he'd cancer. And uh, he'd, he'd fail, he never failed. He got his licence took off him. He was 90 odd years of age. And they took his licence off him, so he had to reset his test. So he'd done that. Right. He said, I'm going for the big 100, Johnny. I've told my brother, I'm going for the big 100. He's going to live to 100, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I fucking I phoned back a few times, somebody answered the phone. And I said, uh, hi there, I said, I'm a friend of Father McDonald's, uh, Johnny Steele. I said, I'm speaking to you, I said, I know he's been getting uh, chemo and that. I said, but I just wonder if, if we could maybe get a wee chance to talk with him. He's like, I'm very sorry to tell you, Father McDonald died a, a couple of months ago. Oh, a lovely man. wee guy and us with other. But he kept me visiting me in the special and that, um, if there if, if they can on the cages. And I also spoke to him when Joe and that was, I spoke to him still and he says, Johnny, to this day, I don't need to tell you a lie. Your, your poems and your bit of verses in my wallet. He says, when I used to go and visit the prisoners in the prison, in the prison hospital, he said, I would often take my poem out and read it out to them. He says, so I hey, said, I've still got another, another part of it. Ah. Can you tell us the story about like, how you developed your relationship with Father MacDonald and the, the poems he's speaking about? <laughs> Oh